Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, we're going to get this meeting going here. Uh, so, uh, it looks like all the seats are taken, but if those of you in the back uh, could let the folks know in the kitchen, we're getting started and we hope to keep it quiet so we could run a, a quick, orderly, efficient meeting. Um, so welcome everybody uh, and thank you for coming. I'm, my name is Alex DeGrassi and I'm a member of the Redwood Valley Municipal Advisory Council, better known as the MAC. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Advisory Council, the MAC was formed in 2016 in response to widespread frustration over having no say in the permitting of a Dollar General store here in the heart of Redwood Valley. At that time, our district supervisor, Carrie Brown, suggested that we form a MAC in order to have a greater voice in local planning, which resulted in the formation of our committee and ultimately in the appointment by the Board of Supervisors of the seven volunteer members and two alternates to the newly formed Redwood Valley MAC. Our members are, and I'm going to ask them all to raise their hands, Chris Boyd, who's our chair. I think she's behind me. Chris. Chris Boyd is our chair. Sheila Rogers, who's our vice chair over here. Uh, Katrina Fry, I saw her mom, she's over here. She's our treasurer. Uh, Deborah Ramirez, who is also uh, the chair of the Little River Band of Pomo Indians. Yeah, out here, Deborah. There's Deborah, okay, great. Um, uh, Cass Tanning, it's right here. And Melinda Hunter, uh, who also serves as a member of the Tribal Council for the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo Indians. Melinda, are you here somewhere? There she is, okay, back there. So, um, we hold public meetings every second Wednesday of the month at 5 p.m. right here in the Grange. And we invite you all to attend the meetings where we will be discussing developments here in the Valley. And I'm sure in the, the meetings to come, we'll, we'll continue to be discussing uh, issues around the fire uh, for some time to come. So please feel, come and attend to their public meetings. We are Brown Acted. Uh, we also post the agendas at the store, the post office, the Grange, as well as online at the redwoodvalleymac.com website where we also post meeting minutes and notices about developments here in the valley. We also occasionally sponsor community meetings such as this one tonight. In fact, tonight's meeting was originally scheduled as the second in a series of three meetings to envision and formulate a Redwood Valley community plan that will be used to update the county general plan in hopes of guiding local planning and giving us a greater voice in our own future. In light of the recent firestorm that has destroyed so many homes and devastated our community, we have shifted tonight's agenda to one of recovery and rebuilding. And to that end, we have invited the recovery team consisting of several county, state, and federal agencies for the purpose of addressing both immediate and long-term needs. Their presentation will be followed by questions and comments from the audience. The recovery team will also make themselves available directly following our meeting in the adjacent room in the kitchen, in the dining area back there at those tables to assist individuals with specific questions about registering for assistance, etc. And they have pledged to stay as long as it takes to get the job done. Tonight's meeting is also being recorded and streamed live online at the County of Mendocino Facebook page and also now I understand at youtube.com Mendoce backslash Mendocino County Video. It will be recorded recorded as well for future reference and I assume it will be available online somewhere not too long. On behalf of the MAC, I would like to acknowledge and thank all the organizations and heroic individuals on the front lines of fighting the fire, including CAL FIRE, the Sheriff's Department, the many out-of-county and out-of-state fires, firefighters, those residents who chose to stay and defend homes, and of course, our local area fire departments, including the Redwood Valley Fire Department. 
two of who's... Thank you, thank you, thank you. And also thanks to the Red Cross, to North Coast Opportunities, and the small army of utility workers from all over Northern California who work long hours to restore power and gas service. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo Indians and the Coyote Valley Casino for their immediate and ongoing response in providing shelter, food, and a variety of services to fire evacuees from the morning of October 9th up until just a few days ago. Thank you, thank you. And finally, thanks to the members of our community who have volunteered their time, services, and an endless supply of food for those in need, and especially to Grange member Jenny Reynolds and Grange manager Mary Beth Kelly, who have been here every day for the past 10 days. They've been here every day for the past 10 days, from early morning till late at night, coordinating a tremendous community effort to provide hot meals, crisis counseling, a play area for kids, radios, batteries, boots, and gloves, and the list goes on and on and on. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone, thank you. Before we continue, I would like to suggest to everyone, and especially to all our government agencies present tonight, that as a result of the devastating fires, we are in a unique situation to consider and implement new technologies and design concepts in the rebuilding process that can make our, safer, uh, our community safer, stronger, and a better place to live. <coughs> this meeting will likely be the first of many community re meetings about recovery, with tonight's emphasis on the urgent needs at hand, but I sincerely hope as this process involved, unfolds, we will have a serious discussion about working with our utility providers, our builders and contractors, and with the county to consider implementing fire safe technologies such as relocating utility services underground, the use of fire safe materials and reconstruction, and design concepts such as orienting buildings to maximize passive solar and heating and cooling, as well as the use of solar panels, panels to produce electricity and hot water. These and many other methods of building can make us a more fire safe, energy efficient, and self-sufficient community. And there will never be a better time to implement these strategies than now. Thank you. So finally, this is a very emotional time for a lot of people. Our heart goes out to all of those who have lost homes, animals, etc. And there will be some difficult questions raised about what happened. And we hope over time that can be explained and answered. But I would ask that we all, uh, all the members, I would ask that we allow members of the recovery team to make their brief presentations without interruptions as the remainder of the meeting will be entirely devoted to questions and comments from the audience. And now I would like to introduce our community plan facilitator who has also generously offered to be tonight's moderator. Please welcome Cliff Pollan. Alex, and thanks to everyone who's here tonight. Um, just a few quick housekeeping items. If you haven't been to the Grange before and you need to use the restroom, they're back in the room over there. Um, there will be a Q&A session um, after the presenters have finished their thing, and there will be a microphone, this microphone here, which will be set up out here. We ask people to please come to the microphone to ask their questions so that everyone can hear the questions that are posed, and please be aware of the cords that are running on. We don't want anyone to trip on the cords when you're going to ask your questions. Um, also, just so people know, there are speakers that are set up outside, so everything that'll be said in here, if it gets too hot and stuffy and you can't stay in here anymore, you can still hear everything that's happening in here and be in the nice cool air outside there. 
Um, I just want to real quickly go through the agenda so people know what's going to happen this evening. And then I'm going to give a few quick remarks on the community action plan process that's underway just so people know about it. Um, so we're going to do that community action plan process real briefly, and then we're going to have presentations from a number of different county, state, and federal presenters. They're all going to give a quick little overview of who they are and what services they have to offer. Um, they are going to, many of those people will be present in the back room there in the kitchen of the Grange after the Q&A session. So if people have individual questions about their homes and their situations, they can go find those resources directly in there. So after those presentations, there will be a Q&A session, and I would ask that people ask questions as much as possible that are applicable to all the people that are in the room. If you have a specific question about where your leech lines are located relative to the footprint of your house, you could save that one for talking to planning and building after the fact so that we all can get all the information that's possible from this evening here. Bathrooms, once again, if you didn't hear, the bathrooms are in the back over there under that exit sign. And there are refreshments or refreshments outside. I still believe there's some pizza and other goodies. So if people are hungry, please feel free to help yourself. So as Alex mentioned, tonight's meeting was not originally meant to be this meeting. Tonight's meeting was supposed to be the second of a three-part series about envisioning the future of Redwood Valley. And for those of you that were here on the first one, which was on the 14th of June, there were about 100 members of Redwood Valley that showed up to envision what is Redwood Valley going to look like in 20 years from now. And there were a lot of really prescient issues that came up then. Fire safety and community safety were big issues that were brought up. And so we've really seen that people in Redwood Valley are looking forward to those things. So the areas that were addressed at that meeting were areas of agriculture, economic development, environment, public safety and security, and public facilities. And the community really showed up and generated a lot of amazing ideas about how we can transform this community moving forward. And all of that information was captured and synthesized and will be going up on the Redwood Valley Max site very soon with some highlighted issues that have become even more um, pressing as this has come to light. So please stay up to date with the map. Please follow what's going on. The second of these three meetings will be rescheduled and we would really invite people to show up and be at those meetings because a lot of really important things about design guidelines. What do we want Redwood Valley to look like? What kind of zoning decisions do we want to have so we can shape future development will all be discussed. In addition to a number of really amazing ideas that were generated by the community that the MAC is going to be looking at spearheading. So I really encourage people to stay present with that process. I know that right now it's hard to sometimes look beyond today or tomorrow, but as Alex said, this is a really unique time to be planning for the future of Redwood Valley. Um, I would like to introduce our panel of speakers. They're going to come up one by one um, in the order that I introduce them. And so tonight, first we're going to have Supervisor Carrie Brown will be giving a little update um, and welcoming from the county. Sheriff Tom Allman will be here giving a few remarks. Um, CEO of Mendocino County, Carmel Angelo, will be making some response, some remarks about um, Mendocino County's efforts. And then Tammy Moss Chandler the, from recovery, the Disaster Recovery um, Department will be here. Nash Gonzalez from Planning and Building will be giving some remarks. Sue Ranachek from the Assessor's Office will be talking about what they're doing. Then some of our federal partners um, from FEMA, Yolanda Stokes, um, the SBA Disaster Loans will be here talking about uh, services that they are providing. And then David Cruz from Cal OES will be here talking about what the state is doing. And finally, Dan Stearns from Eagle Peak Middle School will be giving a few remarks about things that they're doing in the school and how you can get involved. Um, after that, those members will stay up here. And so if people have specific questions for those people, they'll be here um, in addition to some people from the Redwood Valley Fire Department and Cal Fire representatives we up here if you have questions about that. Um, but again, as Alex said, we're going to try and keep tonight focused on recovery as much as possible. Um, and the MAC is here listening to what you all are raising. So um, I know that uh, Mary Beth from the MAC is taking notes about things that are raised. If questions are raised tonight that there isn't enough time to handle in this limited amount of time, please stay present with the MAC. The MAC is here as a part of this community. It's here to listen and represent the needs of this community to the county. And so um, if there's something that can't be answered tonight, we apologize. Apologize. We're doing the best that we can in this limited time frame, um, but we're going to be, this process will continue after this evening. So with that, I'm going to welcome Carrie Brown. I'm 
not very tall. <laughs> you give this to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I want to say I'm going to put a bit of a wrinkle into. Our closer. Keep the mic. All right. I raised a lot of kids. <laughs> I know how to be loud. <laughs> But I am going to put a bit of a wrinkle because there's some important information um, that you need to hear from Redwood Valley County Water District. Um, so we're going to have them come up for the three minutes um, that you're allowing speakers so they can get some important information out to the community. I also want you to know that we have representatives here from Congressman Huffman's office, State Senator Mike McGuire's office, and Assembly Member Jim Wood. And I want to thank them for taking the time. They've been with us throughout um, the incident, and they are here for us in this recovery. And one of the other things I'd like to do is introduce my colleague on the Board of Supervisors, uh, George Ann Krosky from the 3rd District. And I'm going to let her speak for a minute because our friends and neighbors um, in the Willits area have joined us here tonight, those that we're impacted. So, Supervisor Krosky. Thank you. I'll just bend down a little bit. I'm going to be there. Um, so I just wanted to say I'm Georgian Krosky, 3rd District. I do really appreciate those of you from the Willits area who have either come to this meeting or who are watching online. And just make sure that you guys know that I'm here for you. And anything that you can't seem to get answered through our local assistance center or here tonight, feel free to email me or call me. But I'm here to serve you, so I am available anything you need. And you know I'm here with all of you in the first district. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about what you're going to hear tonight um, from both county, local um, assistance, and also state and federal. Uh, these people have been working really, really hard. We have county staff that have volunteered time and also worked their regular work hours 24-7 since this all began. And I do want to do a shout out to them. I'm very proud of them as a county supervisor, and I know the whole board has appreciated all their dedication and work for all of you. Um, uh, yeah, let's give them a hand. So first of all, Mr. Bill Kohler, please come up. And Bill is the general manager for the Redwood um, County Water District, Redwood Valley County Water District, and I know they have some important information. I um, was on the phone with the chair of the board on Sunday, and yes, they want to share with you. Wow, that's uh, more Redwood Valley people in one place I don't so I have to thank a couple of people. One, the Redwood Calpella. I, I want to thank the Redwood Calpella Fire Department. Um, they allowed me to enter uh, and make an evaluation of the district as soon as it was safe. I have to say their idea is safe and my idea is safe are not the same thing. Um, but um, we're used to being the invisible utility, but my crew and volunteers from the city of Ukiah Water, who called me and offered help, uh, we spent two days chasing fire engines and turning off burning houses as their services because we were running out of water. So I'd like to thank my crew and the city of Ukiah. So that being said, the first thing we gotta do, we wanna help you recover. We're working with the county. Um, we're bending as many rules as we possibly can, especially about the issue of getting you folks uh, who may need to stay in RVs or some other type of temporary housing on your property. We'll do whatever we can to make that happen. So. What about the community up top? The what? Community up top. Well, all of you know that the. Tomkai, Fisher Lake, Jenkins Road was devastated. Um, in addition, we lost a major piece of our infrastructure. We have a booster pump station about halfway up Tomkai that uh, boosts pressure up there. Um, I just got a 
rough guesstimate, and we're looking at about $270,000 to replace that piece of equipment. But we're gonna, we've already restored low pressure to the three houses at Jenkins and Tomkai that amazingly survived. Um, and we will hopefully by the end of January have full service restored to all of Tomkai, so Jenkins and Fisher Lake, so that you folks can repopulate. When Bill talked about the county bending rules, uh, it gave me a heads up that I need to tell all of you that the County Board of Supervisors, we're having special meetings, um, and we're also looking at urgency ordinances, um, and numerous ones. So you, the meeting today and then the uh, previous one, you can go back and click on the live streaming and be able to hear the discussion. We will be back in session again on October 31st and probably more Tuesdays, <laughs> add a lot of meetings to, to our schedule as we go forward. But we're trying to make it good for everyone and make it as easy as possible um, for all of us to return, rebuild, and be in our community. So thank you, and Cliff, are you gonna introduce the sheriff? Hey, <laughs> one of um, our very special people in the county organization, Sheriff Tom Amon. Thank you. And um, on behalf of the Sheriff's Office, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the loss of life, loss of property. I'm sorry that we're having to be here tonight to say, how are we going to rebuild? This should have never happened. And I think that history is going to allow us to rebuild everything that happened the first, the first five days. And you deserve the answers. And I've talked to the fire chiefs. And, and our first answer to you is, my obligation is by Thursday, November 9th, you will have an absolute report of the first 12 hours of this fire. Of when the, when the calls came in, the response that were coming in, fire department, law enforcement, I'm assuming CHP will be able to get close to that, but the sheriff's office certainly will be able to give you the numbers of the 911 calls of where they came in and so forth. And, and we're working on that. We're gonna have a full-time person on because we'll get you the answers. The second thing I want to say is, is thank you from the deputy sheriffs. The deputy sheriffs, the first 24 hours, 48 hours, certainly people were very frustrated with law enforcement of being, not being able to get back into a, what was deemed to be a hazardous situation. And uh, other than some, some minor emotions, people understood that and, and we appreciate that. When a, when a disaster happens, we're just trying to do everything we can to protect additional property and prevent life, life loss. So the deputy sheriffs have told me several times, other than a few being called an SOB a couple times, they forgive it, they give, forgive the people because they understand your emotions and, and we're, we're past that. You know, there's a lot of questions that are going to be asked regarding re reverse 911, sirens, everything that's coming up. And trust me, I read Facebook the same as you. <laughs> and and we, we are prepared to get those questions for you. I don't want to give you a, an answer today that's going to change tomorrow. What we're prepared to do is to work very strong to get you the answers that we deserve. So when we are rebuilding Redwood Valley, we're going to rebuild the safest, community in Mendocino County, a community that's going to be here for 100, 200, 300 years that's going to be based on right now, the foundation of, of thinking smart and rebuilding smart. You know what, Nash Gonzalez is in charge of planning and building, and I, I want to tell you this right now. There is nobody in the county that is saying, let's hinder progress, let's hinder what's going on. Nash is a great guy, we, we want to make things happen, but we want to make it right. So if you're going to get mad at somebody, maybe get mad at me, get mad at Nash or somebody, but let's allow the county workers to come in and do the job to get these things taken care of as quick as possible. I, uh, I want to tell you that unfortunately, we're, we're going to be able to rely on Lake County's massive fire, Valley Fire, from, from last year and two years ago. And Sheriff Martin is giving us great advice. Great advice of how lessons they've learned of rebuilding, lessons they've learned of communities coming together. And so if you know somebody from Lake County, I'm telling you their sheriff over there is a great guy. 
He's the best inland sheriff in the state of California. Um, I tell him that all the time. Um, but he has given us lessons that, that we are going to use to make sure that we build correctly. Um, I do want to thank our district attorney, Dave Eister, for being here tonight because one of the things that we want to be very clear about, whether it's debris removal, whether it's rebuilding, whether it's construction, the sheriff's office and the district attorney are joined at the hip to say that if you are an unlicensed contractor that is going to prey upon the victims of Redwood Valley, if you're an unlicensed contractor that's going to charge $200 to, removing, to remove the ashes and you're doing it illegal, I assure you that the sheriff's office and the district attorney want to use you as a poster child as an example. Please. So with that, you're going to see increased sheriff's office and CHP patrol. I would ask that you please post your property with no trespassing because when we see people in property and, and, and they're going through, please don't be offended if our deputy sheriffs come up to you and ask you if you own this property because we want to stop the lowest form of life possible that are coming in and preying upon the victims. So don't be offended. We, we will find out who they are. Um, this is going to be a long meeting, and I want you to know that um, there may be questions that you have that you don't want to ask in front of your neighbors and peers. I will be here until the last person goes home, and I will be outside, and if you have a question that you want to ask, but you don't want to do it on the microphone because you're bashful, I totally understand. So I'll meet you, and I'll talk to you, and I'll do everything I can to get to the answers. So with that, I think I've covered everything I'm supposed to cover. I, I, the district attorney's not on the... Um, agenda, but I, I will say that he's here and he's he, the purpose of being here is to make sure you understand that the criminal justice arena is going to be involved in, in every part of any criminal act that happens in this, whether it's stealing, whether it's uh, insurance fraud, whatever. Honestly, we want to rebuild right and we want to build, rebuild correct. So, out of supervisor. Alrighty, we're going to begin with the speakers, but first um, I'd like to call up our Chief Executive Officer for Mendocino County, Carmel Angelo, to begin the process and introduce the speakers as she has them lined up. Good evening. The week of the fires, uh, in seven days, we did 13 press conferences. And of course, we probably could have done 26. But 13 was good. We got a lot of response, and we hope we got information out. But one of the things that, that I said at every press conference was that the Mendocino County offices are open, and all services are available throughout the fire, and that our 24-7 services are available. And I assure you during this recovery phase that I can say the same thing. All Mendocino County offices are open, will be open. Our 24 seven services are available. And if you need something and you think you're not getting it, you could call the executive office. And that's 463-4441. Or your county supervisor. <laughs> we'll give you Carrie Brown's cell phone number. There's probably only one person in this room that doesn't have it. <laughs> Okay, so um, we are in the recovery phase, which you're going to hear a lot about tonight will be cleanup, debris cleanup, which is our number one priority as we move forward. Who you have tonight in front of you is really the county's A team, and they're here. They're here to uh, answer your questions and discuss what we're doing. Also, I'd like to say that we will be having additional community meetings. This is the first of many. And we will develop a schedule, and that schedule will be uh, uh, public as soon as we develop it. Uh, Supervisor Brown mentioned that I will be introducing our speakers, and I just want to say that the county is so committed to this recovery and doing it right that we've identified a recovery director. So basically one person who is coordinating and organizing the services, and that's Tammy Moss Chandler, who has been our Health and Human Services Director and has been reassigned to do recovery. Tammy will come up after me. After Tammy will be Nash Gonzalez, our planning and building director, and he is our lead with debris cleanup. And between Tammy and Nash, they 
really have been working 24-7, dealing with the state, dealing with the feds, and trying to answer community questions and getting everything lined up. Uh, tonight we have our assessor clerk recorder, Sue Ranachek here. She will follow Nash. And then we have Yolanda Stokes, who is a Small Business Association disaster loan expert. Yolanda, will you just raise your hand? I don't know where you are. She's here, I saw her. Anyway, Yolanda, oh, there we go. Okay, Yolanda will be speaking after Sue Ranachek. We also have David Cruz, the Deputy Regional Administrator from Cal OES here this evening. And everybody's already said it, but I'll just say it again, Cal OES, the state, the feds, FEMA, they've been very supportive and they really are here to help. So with all that said, I'm going to turn it over to Tammy now, but I want you to know this is the first of many community meetings. We want to hear from you. We want to do recovery right. We know that this will be an extensive process. We're looking at two or three years, really, to get through recovery. And the county is open. We're open, and we're here to serve you. Tammy? Thank you to the MAC for inviting the county to be here tonight. We have a lot of people here that aren't going to speak tonight, but they're in the back room. And as it's been said, we'll be here as late as we need to to answer your individual questions. We have Trey Strickland, our environmental health director. We have our core community-based organizations that have been leaders coordinating with us. We have Patty Bruder, who's the executive director of North Coast Opportunity Center. And North Coast has a local application that they're doing in partnership with the Community Foundation to get as much resource and support out as quickly as possible to our community uh, as people are applying and going through the process with FEMA and our state organizations. And we definitely want to make sure people know that um, our other key local partner is West Company. And what they're doing is we have a continuity of our federal loan and assistant programs that we have locally, our partners who are going to be with us over the months to come, over the years to come, to work through and recover together. And I also want to make sure that uh, we recognize that we have other department heads like Howard DeShill here with uh, Department of Transportation and we have our farm and ag community here represented and we know as it's been said that there's going to be a lot of different topics and work groups that need to be formed to address our various issues whether it's water whether it's agriculture whether it's specific business needs and then your individual community needs so the first most important message I want you to hear tonight about recovery is that we have a local assistance center and we couldn't bring all 20 plus organizations to you tonight. It's at Mendocino College and um, there are a lot of organizations that are going to be there every day from 10 a.m. till 7 p.m. And uh, we want to make sure that you can get there. If you have any transportation barriers, you can go to the local assistance center table in the back room, and we'll make sure to help you get there this week while we have all of our state and federal partners there. We have FEMA assistance here tonight because one of the first big important steps you'll hear about tonight, and Alan Ball is our local FEMA representative here, who's our liaison. He has a whole team of people to make sure people can apply and get their questions answered of how to get into the federal process for FEMA assistance assistance and uh, we have a whole team of people to answer any specific questions you have tonight. We also are working with our local hotels to make sure that everyone who needs a place to stay over the next few days or few weeks or few months has a hotel if, you cover, if you're covered through that FEMA assistance program. And there's certainly a number of other benefits you'll hear just a little bit tonight about, but there's many more at the local assistance center. And then most importantly, we want to make sure you have the current information about debris cleanup and what we want to do to help protect your health, your family's health, your property, our public areas, our waterways as quickly as possible. And I'm going to turn it over to Nash Gonzalez actually to share a little bit about uh, the overview of that cleanup. Thank you, Nash. Good evening, everybody, and I'm really sorry for all your losses, but uh, let's talk about cleanup, debris, and so on. So, what we're looking at overall is the Department of Toxic Substances uh, is in the area right now doing overviews, assessments, and removing household hazardous waste. Once these sites have been cleared by the Department of Toxic Substances, then the Army Corps of Engineers will be tasked with coming in and doing the debris removal. So all of this process is going to take several weeks. We understand from uh, DTSC that it will be 
um, three to four weeks before they're completed. Uh, what was said to me earlier this evening is they have completed the sweep of 22 homes already. They have begun at the north end of the valley at uh, Fisher Lake and they're going to be moving southward. Another team will be moving from the southern end of the valley up towards the middle and then later they will be moving towards the north end and looking at the um, Cave Creek uh, area. With that said, they will also be looking at the Willits area They will be, uh, and then Potter Valley or sending teams in both directions. The whole idea is to get our area cleaned up as soon as possible so that the Corps of Engineers can come in and start doing the debris removal so that we can get the homes, the buildings rebuilt as soon as possible. And as the sheriff mentioned, we're not here to create impediments. We're here to create opportunities so that we can get the residences back onto their properties. One of the things that we did last week or a week and a half ago, while the fires were still going on, my staff and I met to try to look at opportunities to get people back onto their properties. And one of the things that we're taking to the board is an urgency ordinance that would basically allow the opportunity for recreational vehicles, um, trailers, mobile homes to be put on property temporarily while you rebuild. And again, relaxing a lot of the standards. So we're looking at trying to create those opportunities to get people back onto their own properties because I know that most people don't want to live in hotels, they don't want to live on somebody else's property, but we're looking at opportunities to get you back onto your property. So uh, I know that there's a representative from DTSC here this evening. Adam, I don't know if you're back here um, but I was just going to have him come up and, and talk a little bit about what they're doing. Um, oh, Adam. Uh, good evening. My name is Adam Palmer. I'm the supervisor of uh, the Department of Toxic Substances Control's Emergency Response Unit. Uh, we've been mission tasked by the Office of Emergency Services to come to Mendocino County and assess and remove all the household hazardous waste from the homes destroyed in the recent fires. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of experience. We've been very active the last couple years in some of the fires in Northern and Southern California. So our first phase is when we come onto your property, we have a radiological meter. We will look for rad sources. We also look for any off-gassing. We have a multi-gas detector. If we identify any of those areas, we'll mitigate those. We then have our hazmat team come in and sweep your whole property. I know in a lot of cases there's multiple structures on the property, so we try to get to each one. We remove um, propane canisters, you know, the five gallon variety that you have with your barbecue. Uh, we do not touch the big ones, uh, that's between the gas company and the homeowner. Uh, but we will, we will take uh, large cylinders, acetylene variety, uh, we will mitigate those. We typically take the valves off them and we'll mark them with the white X. So when you come back to your property, if you see that laying there, that's basically scrap metal at that point. We also look for you know, the kind of things you're gonna have in your garage. Pesticides, herbicides, uh, waste oil, fuels. Today we removed a couple 55 gallon drums of waste oil. That's typical. Um, what other kind of items? Um, anything that falls into the criteria of household hazardous waste. So solvents, waste oils. Uh, you'll see our crews out there. Um, all we ask is while we're working, you don't enter the footprint of the, the fire. But if you do have questions, we do have crew leaders on site. Feel free to come up and ask. Um, if you have any questions specifically as to what we're doing, we're gonna do the best we can to be out of here in four weeks. Um, I'm gonna be bringing in more crews um, as we finish up in Lake County, Yuba County, and some of the other counties that we've been mission tasked to go to. So um, the plan is to finish in four weeks. I'd like to compress that to three. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm sorry for your loss, uh, and uh, like I said, whatever we can do, I'm gonna stay here as, like the sheriff said, I'll stay as late as you want. If you have any specific questions, I'll be at the back of the room. Thank you. As we know, this is a very daunting, overwhelming task. Uh, many counties were hit by this. So because of the large scale of devastation, it's not something that state agencies can come in without the help of the federal partners, FEMA, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. And so for that reason, and um, I'll probably, I'll turn to Cal OES who can answer a lot of those questions, but 
the magnitude is so large that they had to ask the federal government to come in and help. Otherwise, you know, we would be doing this for months and months. And the idea is to get in, get the areas cleaned up as quickly as possible. We know that winter is coming very soon. We know the rainy seasons are coming. We want to look at getting those sites assessed, cleaned up, and get you rebuilt. And so I'm going to ask Mr. Cruz to come up here and, and uh, add a few um, comments. Okay. Yeah, why don't you, I'm going to go right there. There you go. All right. All right, so I'm going to ask my FEMA partner to come up here, and we're going to do this as one piece. Uh, so we got our Army Corps here as well. Uh, so, good evening. My name is David Cruz. I'm the Deputy Regional Administrator for the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Um, I've done a couple of these town halls since fires started, uh, and today is day 16. And, um, you know, without a doubt, I'm just going to say that our hearts go out to all of you who have been affected, impacted. Um, those of you who have lost loved ones uh, and your homes, uh, most importantly. Um, there's no way we can express at this point how much we are tied to you, to all of you. Um, this wildfire uh, is unprecedented. It's the most destructive wildfire in California history. It's the largest state disaster since 1906. If you take the number of homes, I mean, just some of the numbers are just sort of staggering. Um, I think we're at 8,700 homes lost between these four counties. Um, you can combine the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Houston, Florida, as far as how many homes are destroyed, and we're more. So it's a, it's a big, big undertaking. And with that said, um, I'm really proud to be here joined by some of our state partners like the Highway Patrol and CAL FIRE, uh, but most importantly, you know, our partners with the county, Carmel, um, Tammy, Rick, the sheriff, uh, you guys are incredible partners for us to be able to serve, and you guys serve your community so well. And I think everybody needs to keep that in mind is that we work for the county. We call federal help, we call FEMA for help, and they're helping us to help the county, who are in turn here to help all of you. Um, this, this cleanup task that's in front of us is monumental. Um, that's why we've asked for FEMA, sorry, I'm gonna adjust this, the feedback is horrible. Um, that's why we've asked FEMA for the help for this debris cleanup, uh, and that's how they've tasked now the Army Corps of Engineers to come in and help us do this, uh, along with DTSC, and that's a state agency that's been tasked. Um, I know you guys have a lot of questions about the right of entry, about insurance, um, and we're here to answer all those, uh, and we're here for you for that, and, and the county is as well. We're providing a good coordinated effort with their county uh, PIO staff, our PIO staff, to make sure you guys have the most up-to-date information um, to be able to make the decisions uh, that you need to make. Um, I guess if I could address one thing uh, with all of you while I have your attention, it's this right of entry form and what it really means. And that it essentially is to take advantage of this debris cleanup effort that the state and the federal government is going to pay for. Uh, this is a free program being made available to you because of the scope of this devastation. Um, we definitely encourage everybody to take advantage of it. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, if you're insured, um, you will, if there's a specific carve out inside of your policy for debris removal, that is something that the county will recoup later from you, from your insurance company directly. If there isn't a specific carve out in your insurance policy, then you make yourselves whole, you guys build your homes. If there's anything left over at the end, that's when the county would try to recoup some of the cost of the debris removal, and that's just being good stewards of public dollars. That's what it comes down to. Um, again, I know that doesn't address everything. It's a small part. Um, so yeah, just know that we we really feel for you. We're, we're, we're in this with you. Many of our, our team, who have been on the ground since day one, have been personally affected by the fires. 
Um, it's tough, guys. I mean, I'm just going to be really honest. This is a really tough situation. Um, there's nothing easy about it. Your sense of community, when I walked in here and I saw all the smiling faces and the, the just that cheerfulness of, of being together was like the highlight of my past 16 days. So uh, thank you for that. Um, if there's anything we can do, we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you. So the right of entry form, our department, planning and building, will be is mailing those forms out. There'll be two to an envelope. We're gonna ask that you complete one, send it back to our department. Uh, we have them here this evening. And again, that will allow these folks to come in and do their job once the properties have been assessed for a household hazardous waste. Um, again, we can help you with those forms in the back this evening. Um, I know there's a lot of questions that have been raised about, um, you know, the septic systems and so on. Septic systems are not going to be removed. What they're going to do is try to be as careful as possible with, with, their, uh, with the removal. They're looking at the footprint. They're looking at the ash. They're looking at the debris. Again, a lot of this stuff is now toxic. And so the idea is that all this will be picked up and taken away by the Army Corps of Engineers to an approved landfill somewhere um, that will accept it. There are no approved landfills in this county. So again, as the sheriff and others have mentioned earlier, uh, you know, don't be fooled by somebody wanting to charge a couple hundred dollars and asking you for the money up front to remove this. They can't take it anywhere in this county. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Sue Branicek with the uh, assessor clerk recorder. Good evening, I'm Sue Renichak, I'm the Assessor Clerk Recorder. First of all, let me say, uh, myself and my staff, uh, you have all of our sympathy over the losses of your homes, and um, we'll do our best to adjust those tax bills as quickly as possible. So let me talk a little bit about that process. We're asking you to fill out damage reports for us, and we have collected 139. Um, at this point, the importance of that damage report is it also includes a waiver of the first installment of your property tax bills. So if you do complete those forms for us, you will get a grace period to pay that first installment, which is due December 10th. And now I'll give you some bad news. Those are going to be started. They were started to be mailed this afternoon. So you should have them in your post office boxes probably on Friday. But um, that doesn't mean we won't be proactive. If you don't file a damage return, we're also looking at Google Earth. They already have uh, pictures of the fire up. We will be putting a parcel layer over that so we can identify every property that's been destroyed or every uh, outbuilding that has been destroyed. So I can assure you we will correct everything whether you file a damage report or not. We are also providing um, vital records. If you've lost your birth certificates, or your marriage licenses, or any death certificates. The governor has declared this a disaster and has waived all fees for those vital records. So we have those forms available for you to fill out. We will be at the lap through the close, so we will continue to be there. You can come into our office at 501 Logap Road in room 1020. We will also be open tomorrow evening through Friday and Monday evening to match the lax hours. So we will be open until 7 p.m. Um, I'll leave it at that and uh, we'll, I will introduce Yolanda from SBA. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yolanda Stokes. I'm a public information officer with SBA's Office of Disaster Assistance, or the Small Business Administration. And many of you are probably wondering how it is and why are you being referred to the Small Business Administration if you're a homeowner who has gone through a disaster. Uh, in disasters, the SBA uh, 
not only provides loans to businesses of all sizes, private nonprofits, but we provide low interest disaster loans to homeowners and renters. And I know that this room is filled with folks who have lost their homes and had significant damage to their homes. So we don't want, and we didn't want to miss out on this opportunity to share with you how the program can help you to move forward. Now the first step in accessing any of the federal programs is to first register with FEMA. And if I could just by show of hands see how many folks have already registered with FEMA, I'm hoping that I see lots and lots of hands. Okay, very good, but I think there are still some folks who probably still need to register with FEMA and we do have the um, disaster assistance folks here in the back that can help you register tonight. Again, the first step to accessing any of the programs is to first register with FEMA. And then if you are referred to the Small Business Administration, we want you to complete that loan application. A homeowner is eligible for up to $200,000 to replace or repair your primary residence. It does have to be a primary residence and not a secondary home. And then an additional $40,000 for your content. So my homeowners have potential eligibility for up to $240,000 low interest rate of 1.75%. We try to stretch that term out to 30 years. We want to kind of mirror a, a mortgage so that we can make that, that term long for you and make that payment a lot more affordable for you. In addition to those two tools that we use to make the loan payments affordable, for this particular disaster, we have approved a one-year deferment, so no loan payment for the first year so that you can concentrate on your recovery. So you see we have several tools that we can use to make this loan affordable for you. The low interest rate of 1.75 for my homeowners, for private nonprofits is 2.5%, and for business owners is 3.3%. So we have the low interest rate, the extended term, and we also have the deferred payment for one year. For private nonprofits and businesses of all sizes, you can access loans up to $2, uh, $2 million, and that's twofold in that you can get a recovery for your damaged property as a business owner, and also there may be businesses who have been impacted financially, economically, so you need working capital. So when I speak of, of my business owners, I want to make sure that there may be folks who have rental properties. Um, so you would qualify under the business loan application. Please, please, please complete that disaster loan application, whether or not you feel like you want a loan or even need a loan, because as you begin your recovery process, you may find that you have additional needs beyond what your insurance can provide if you do indeed have insurance. The SBA loan program is here for those who are insured, don't have enough insurance, or those who don't have insurance at all. So we want to cover everyone. We have a program basically for everyone. Again, homeowners, renters, private nonprofits such as schools and churches, homeowners associations, businesses, including my folks that have rental properties. Again, please take advantage of the SBA represent representatives that are there on site at the local assistance center. We are there to provide face-to-face -face assistance for you. If you are not able to make it down to the local assistance center, certainly you can go ahead and apply online at sba.gov. There's a banner page specifically for this disaster, and you can go ahead and apply online. And just as a note, I, I was able to pull some stats today for this particular county, and we have issued more than 700 loan applications. The majority of them are for homeowners, but we've only received 35 loan applications back. So that means that there may be some folks that were actually confused about whether or not they should apply because they didn't realize that we have a program for homeowners and renters. But we need to see those loans uh, turn around. So we want to see those, you know, those applications that were issued actually turn into full-blown applications. Again, there's no obligation to accept the loan. If you are approved for the loan, your insurance does indeed come through, or you find the means to make full recovery, you can simply ask the loan to be canceled. On the opposite side of that, if you find that you, uh, your insurance is taking a long time, you don't have to wait for your insurance to settle. Go ahead and apply for the loan. If your insurance does come through and it's enough for your full recovery, simply cancel the loan. Or if you need additional funds, you can ask for an increase. A lot of flexibility built into the loan program. And then there's also some folks out there who have an existing for, uh, first mortgage. SBA also has a program that can help potentially uh, refinance your existing debt. So I'll be available to answer questions one-on-one -on -one for you, but I just want to encourage everyone, please complete that loan application and just keep it out there as an option in your recovery. No uh, obligation to take the loan if you don't need it. Thank you so much for your time.
Good evening, my name is uh, Dan Stearns. I'm the principal of Eagle Peak Middle School here in Redwood Valley. It's nice to see folks. Nice to see folks here. I'm here to talk about our children, our beautiful, awesome children who have suffered tremendously, many of which have bounced back, and many of which are really suffering, I must say. So the main thing that we would like to offer as part of the school district in Eagle Peak Middle School is a ton of counseling services and support for our students. So we're, we're collecting information about the children's stories and about their losses and figuring out ways to help them and support them. For the student who never wants to come back to Redwood Valley again and live here again and go to our schools, we're gonna meet and get counseling help and support that kiddo. For the student who lost their ukulele and told us, we had a ukulele in an hour. So there, there's stories we may not know. There's children we may need to help from the school district and from Eagle Peak. So if you know of those stories and you know of kids in need, please contact our school. And even if they don't attend Eagle Peak, we're in contact with all the schools, even outside of our school district, and we will get them help. So share with us the stories of the children who are still in need and who've lost stuff. And I'll share one quick interesting story. The one thing most of the kids picked up when they evacuated was their school backpack. Interestingly enough, I need my backpack, I need my computer. So our kids are awesome, and there's still years of challenge ahead for them. Contact the school and share us the stories of the kids and let us know how we can help. Um, just come by Eagle Peak or call. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of our presenters. So now we are going to have the Q&A section of the evening. Um, Charlie's going to be setting the mic up out here. If you have a question, please come to the mic. If there's a group of people, we'll just have a queue for them behind the mic. We do please ask that you keep your questions as succinct as possible so that we can get these questions in. I know there's a lot of hot, shifty people out there right now. I understand that. Um, so. Please be succinct with your question. If you know who you're addressing it to, you can ask them to come up. If it's an open-ended question, we'll try and find the right person. And then after this Q&A session, there will be representatives in the back room. All right. Hi, my name is Nina Sullivan. I wanted to know about this cleanup process. We fill up the forms, give it to you. Hi, I have a loud voice normally. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, quiet down everybody. Okay, so we fill out the form, give it to you, but can we be there when you're taking our stuff away so that we can, you know, one of the papers said you would help us find a couple of things. I mean, I don't expect you to find a hundred things, but if there are a couple of heirlooms, could you help us? Absolutely. So, uh, my name is Josh with the Army Corps of Engineers. I'm a debris subject matter expert. I grew up in the Nevada County area, so I'm, I'm very familiar with fires. Uh, absolutely. So, the process for our contractor, when we're on site, if the homeowner shows up and makes us aware of that, we will absolutely stop work and let you come in to look for things and we can help you recover those things on site. Uh, we just need you to notify that, that we're there. We'll have an exclusion zone for safety. We'll have big equipment uh, and we'll be testing the whole time for uh, hazardous materials, we'll be doing air testing, etc. So as soon as we're aware that you're there, we can stop that work and let you come onto the site. But will we know when you're coming? Will, do we get enough notice? Yes, so our process after we collect the ROEs, we will notify the homeowner uh, 24 to 48 hours before we go onto your property that we're going to begin uh, work on that property. So a good point was brought up, uh, this is vital for us is that we get a quality contact number for you. If we cannot get a hold of you, that will slow down our work and process. So when you sign the ROE forms out, please make sure that we have a, a good contact number on that form. I know that's listed, I believe, in several places, but that's a vital piece of information for us to get the work going. That contact number is going to be very imperative, so if you've got a primary number, an alternate number, and an email address, that is really going to go a long way. Thank you. Nash, you, Nash, you can stay there. 
<laughs> Hi, I'm Rodney Escher from Bonnie Cameron Manufactured Homes. We're the local dealer that does most of the housing. Our question is, up until a few years ago, manufactured homes were on the expedited item that could be done with permits on the expedited counter. Can we do that again? Go with expedited permits that we've done for years and move them along quickly so people can recover? Well, the idea is to get recovery back as soon as possible. So yes, when we start dealing with the rebuilding, we want to get people back onto their properties. And the nice thing about mobile homes is that you don't have to wait for an architect to draw a plan. You already have set up booklets. So the key thing is I'll be talking with the building official to try to set up a process so that um, we can go ahead and expedite these. Well, I've already started to submit permits. And I've got a few more this week and next week to submit because I'm trying as quick as possible. So I'm just wondering with environmental health support and yours, if we could you know, move those forward and do this on the counter like we used to for fire victims. Are these for fire victims right now? Yeah. Okay. I did one so, already. So again, we haven't started that process because we're looking at the debris and most of the inspectors, if not all, have been in the field doing assessments. So you haven't gotten immediate uh, uh, attention on those permits last week or this week because those building inspectors were in the field perfectly until 10 o'clock at night. No, so but the idea is to actually get that process going so we can expedite. Excellent. Okay, that's what we yeah. wanted. Thank you. My name is Calvin Payne. Uh, my question is, how is a handoff occurring from Department of Toxic Services to the Army Corps? So, uh, we're working in conjunction with them right now. So, as they are clearing properties, we're using GIS mapping services, plot maps of the local counties to figure out what homes have been cleared and targeting those first. So, as they clear homes, we'll be able to move contractors in. We don't need to wait for every single home in the area to be cleared. We'll be able to move forward as soon as we get enough homes that have ROEs finished, that are cleared from HHW, Household Hazardous Waste, we'll begin to move our contractors into those areas immediately. My name is Anthony Grippy. Um, my question is actually also to uh, the Army Corps. Um, as the um, as DTSC finishes up their work with sort of a, a fine blade and Army Corps comes in with you know more of a larger larger scope, um, we've heard of some situations that perhaps have happened over in Lake County where homeowners were um, the land was a little bit disturbed and, and basically uh, uh, beach lines and septic systems um, were affected and in some cases homeowners signed and had to indemnify uh, the contractors that were working on their properties and basically at the end of it all they didn't have compacted soil and there were problems after the fact. Can you address any of those possibilities as it applies to what, what your plans are? So is this in relation to the 2015 fires that happened? Yes sir. Right now with our contractors, our goal is to get on the property, clean that off and leave it in such a manner that you can begin rebuilding. So we're scraping, we're not doing compaction, uh, but we will be scraping off, removing toxic soils, we'll be testing down where we've been authorized by FEMA to remove as much as six inches of soil as far as testing goes to make sure that we're getting down to clean soil so that we're leaving you with an area that uh, can be built on immediately. We will be scraping them flat, but again, we're not going to be doing compaction on those areas. We, however, will be mitigating for local runoff. So one of the things we'll do before we start any kind of work, we'll be wetting down ash, those types of things, is trying our best uh, to the fullest extent possible to limit runoff into streams, waterways. Uh, we'll be covering storm drains. We'll be doing all those things so that all the work that we're doing is not going to adversely affect the environment and the local ecosystem around us while we're working. Yes, sir. Well, we have to indemnify the contractors that come on the property. Absolving them of any, you know, any uh, damage, you know, leach lines, septic systems, and what, you know, of that sort. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Not that I, not because I won't, because I, I'm not sure what the answer is to that question. I don't, I don't want to tell you something that I'm not aware of. Uh, that's something that we can run down and we'll get the answer back to your representative so they can answer that correctly. Thank you very much. Um, this, is a, this is a question that um, 
touches on a point that Alex uh, was making in the beginning um, about orienting the houses to be passive solar design and things like that, and at the same time, there are already footprints and, um, you know, people might want to have a home like they had before, and at the same time, how can we sensitively move ourselves to having more energy efficient and, um, you know, global warming has anything to do with this fire, whatever people think of that. Um, we can start the solution be an example. How do we do that and be sensitive when people want to get into their homes quickly? I, it just seems like there may be different interests going on. How can all of the different officials here work together to help people make that happen and be sensitive to their need to get home really quickly? Um, anyway, I, I don't know if you get the gist of that, but. I'll try to answer that. Um, looking at local land use regulations, local zoning and so on, we will try to accommodate the, the, I'll say, the reshifting of the footprint to accommodate for the solar. So a lot of these are large parcels that you can go ahead and move the structure. A lot of these buildings were built a long time ago. There, there will be the need or there will be the desire to not rebuild in the same footprint. The question is, do you have enough area that you can, you know, adjust the, the, the property? You know, if you choose to work with a solar consultant or an architect, they will orient that for you. Um, but again, we're going to be as um, open to that as we can, working within the existing parameters and um, land use regulations. Again, um, Alex can probably address what they're looking at is the future. Again, what we're looking at at planning and building is the immediate rebuilds right now. It's trying to get people back onto their properties as soon as possible. Their process is a long process of trying to look at the amendment of, of the general plan, which again, they're looking at community planning. Um, I can't speak for how long it's going to take, but our job right now is to get you rebuilt as soon as possible. Um, hello, my name is Ziggy Daniels. I'm from West Jordan Tomkai. I am, was a renter. Um, my question is directly to the county, the Board of Supervisors, and also to FEMA. What is going to happen to the people who do not have your property to go back to, or even homeowners who were not insured? Is FEMA going to be bringing in trailers or temporary shelter? What is the county doing? We already have a homeless state of emergency in this county. So, and it's going to get worse. So as a renter, I, people who are renters need to know what's going to go on because I'm about to be on the street with my partner who is terminally ill and we still have not gotten uh, uh, our money to pay for a hotel in Ukiah. Thank you. So if you come to the back, we'll make sure, between Alan Ball and his representatives, we make sure that you have your FEMA assistance in hoteling needs, immediate needs met. But I want to assure you that we are already talking with our state and federal partners about expediting, expediting creative housing opportunities through FEMA. There's already been an order placed through the state with FEMA to try to deploy um, FEMA, FEMA housing options to this county. And we'll be working really closely. It's one of our core groups. We know we're already and is in a critical state around homelessness and housing needs here. And we, we are committed for the long term, as well as the immediate term, like Nash said, we're committed to working with your community planner on housing. So I just want to follow that up a little bit about the FEMA trailer piece. And it's okay, she's walking away. Um, so an order has already gone in for these emergency trailers. And understand that, you know, Nationwide, there's many orders in right now for these, right? For all the other homes that have been destroyed across the U.S. Um, that production facility is already running 24-7, 365. Uh, the soonest we're probably going to see those trailers is months and months away. So with that said, you know, there's the hotel voucher program, and you can, you can start connecting to that through the local assistance center and registering with FEMA and getting on that, getting, getting on those lists. And there are dollars available to help you with that now and, and for a good amount of time, right? And then the county's gonna help you with that long-term housing need and how you're gonna transition off of that. So there's a lot of support for you right now and it didn't really matter whether you were homeless before or if you were fire ravaged. It doesn't make any difference. We're here to help you.
Uh, hi, my name is Mark. Uh, I own property in West Road, and my property is uh, bordered on one side by a creek and on the other side by the Russian River. And my question goes to the large number of trees that fell both in the river and the creek, some burned, some not. And the question is, can I remove them, or do I have to get a permit, or do I want to get cleanup going before the rains come? <laughs> all look at each other right there you have it so um, if we could get your specifics there's actually some folks I'd like to talk with you individually and more about your particular situation but actually about tree removal it is complicated depending on where it is if it's in a public thoroughway private area um, and if it's you know uh, in pg and &E's areas so we need to get your real specifics and if you find actually someone in a yellow vest they'll take down your info so we can be sure to connect tonight or later okay My name is Regina Payne, and I am, my question is kind of along the line of the trees, along the lines of trees on the property that have been burnt all up. Is someone going to come in, or is a landowner going to have to, you know, get a tree service in? It, it's kind of the same situation, right? If there's a safety issue with the tree during the cleanup, it's going to come down. If there's a safety problem. Otherwise, it's going to be part of your overall rebuild process. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Richard Perron. I want to know when you come in and the clean out, uh, is, is it the hazardous waste and all the dust going to be removed first before the crews come in and clean up? And also, can I have a crew there because there's stuff in the way that I have to get out before the clean up is uh, started? I didn't catch all of that, but I believe that'll be for me. Can you repeat your question, please, sir? I want to know if you're going to clean up the dust and the hazardous waste, anything loose before the crew comes in there and scrapes and removes the foundations or whatever, because there's stuff I need to get out of there while they're cleaning up. There's stuff in the way and vice versa. So our, our initial process is that when we come in, we'll be wetting down and removing all the ash and the dust that's accumulated on top of everything before we remove uh, standing chimneys, other damaged uh, structures, debris removal. So that'll be kind of our normal process. And again, uh, as I spoke to you before, if you are on site as the homeowner in that area and we need to stop work for you to come look for things or remove things on your property, uh, that would be something you could do right right then at that time. So you okay, have to so let I us know have, that you were I there. I can have a crew come in there and while they're working and stand by and, and move please. If it was removing uh, personal effects goods, yes, yeah. absolutely. All right. Second, second, second question. Are we going to be notified before you come into our property? Yes. Again, that's the the right of entry form. We're we're looking for a contact information on that. Emails those, and we're notifying people 24 to 48 hours before we, the Corps of Engineers, will let our contractors onto your property. Thank you very much. Again, as a reminder on the right of entry forms, those are being mailed out. Those need to be returned back to the Planning and Building Department, where we will go ahead and process those and provide copies of those to the Army Corps of Engineers. Hi, my name is Pamela Dorsey. I'm wondering who carries the workman's comp and liability if someone's to be hurt on my property during the, any of the processes that you have in place. So our contractors have full workers' comp liability for all of their workers and everything that's done. So they're fully liable for all the injuries to their workers. It's all going to be under California federal standards. They'll be paying prevailing wages. Everything is lined out in our contract, so they'll be fully responsible for that. What about any liability if you damage something that wasn't damaged before? So that's something that I have to run down that was uh, talked about, for instance, uh, leach fields. If a leach field is damaged and it was not damaged before and we drive a tractor through it and tear the whole thing up, I need to run that down and see exactly what that process looks like to repair that. I'm not sure exactly how much of the responsibility and who that falls on, and I want to make sure I give you a correct answer on that. And then who gets to decide what's debris and what's not debris? FEMA decides what's eligible debris and what's not eligible debris. And then if your insurance has a policy, let's just say $10,000, to clean up debris, and it costs more to do that, who's responsible to pay for the extra? 
the Corps of Engineers is that's all covered under the, the FEMA dollars for the removal. There's you will be not charged at all for that. That's all covered under federal dollars. Okay, I'd like to talk to you afterwards because I know of other people that were sent bills in Lake County afterwards that worked with FEMA, OES, and Cal Recycle. And I'm not talking small bills, people here. I'm talking huge bills, and I can show you them. So I'd like to hear that from you before I sign anything that you come on my property. But I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Don't get me wrong. I'll be here as long as any of me. Okay, thanks. Yeah, my name, my name is Anne, and I'm trying to just make sure I understand the process. You're initially going to come on to our property. You're going to notify us 24 to 40 hours. We do not sign any right of entry for that first initial toxic waste removal. How will we know who you are? Because I'm, my house is one that's um, damaged but standing in a neighborhood that's completely burned out. So I'm quite suspicious of who's swarming around right now. So that's the first question. I mean, it's a, I'm going to look to DTFC for just yeah. a second. I mean, the home isn't completely destroyed, and you want a cleanup effort. I'm not well, I want to know the first step when you're going to come in and remove that hazardous chemicals. And I understand that's different from the, the thing that we signed for to have FEMA, FEMA come in, or the Army Corps, correct? So, so the ROE is to allow FEMA Army Corps right. to come in and clean out all the debris. Understood, right. but there's something that you talked about prior to that. Yeah, so that's the, the household hazardous yes, waste. that's the one I'm right? talking about. So that's happening now. Right. Okay, so I'm trying to, I guess, differentiate what you're saying. Your house is still standing, yes. but you think somebody's going to come Well, I've got, I've, got, I've got other buildings that have burned that have mm -hmm. probably some household hazardous okay. waste in them. So the first process is coming in yeah. and removing those household hazardous chemicals. How will I know who you are? And I do not have to give permission for that, correct? Right, and that was because of the governor's executive order, because it's a... Um, so how will you identify yourselves on site? We'll have, uh, we'll have placards on our vehicles identifying us as uh, representatives from the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Okay. We'll probably, you'll probably see two or three of our vehicles, and then you'll see a couple box trucks and a couple three-quarter ton pickups. Mm -hmm. And what we do is when we come on a piece of property and we see the primary house is still standing, we always go over and talk to the property owner, knock on the door, okay. make sure they're home. If they have any questions, we're there to answer your questions. So uh -huh. we always try to... It won't be a subcontractor that's no, it's my poorly identified. No, okay. It's my contractor. I will have a DTSC crew person with them the entire time. Okay. And we also have a county representative with us at all times as well. Is there any number to call to find out when you're likely to be in my neighborhood? I could give you my crew leader's cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she will. Second question. I'm hearing a lot of concern in the community about signing the um, right of entry and signing up with the floor because you don't have any choice about what's removed. So for example, I have a building that's not covered under insurance that had a concrete slab. Is that going to necessarily be torn up, or will I have any choice about that? So, I mean, if you want it to be done and it's not insured... I don't. You don't. I want to rebuild on that slab if I can. But it's been burnt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What was above it was burnt. Yeah, so, so the slab's going to go. I mean, that's, that's the, how, how it's going to work right now. Based on the experience that we have with the toxic substances and the slabs, a fire of this magnitude and how hot it was, the slab's toxic. Okay, I just wanted everybody to hear that. <laughs> so, on that subject, one of the one of the things that besides the slabs, the foundations are likely going to have to go as well, because a lot of the foundations were subject to failure because of the uh, fire. So again, many of the foundations. Um, did experience cracking as a result of the fire, and again, this is something that the Army Corps has indicated that they will clean the site, including the foundation. Um, my name is James Brzezinski, and I, uh, my land is on Domkai Road, one of the places that got hit the hardest, and my land got hit from side to side. And uh, I have my primary house, uh, 
moved right down into the ground, and so did a secondary house and outbuildings. In fact, everything went. Um, and my question was about the foundations, which you actually just answered, because I was, uh, I read in the Press Democrat that any wildfire requires that the foundations be fully removed. And my question was, was there a way to test that to see how badly damaged any one of them might have been? Or did they just do a big uh, roundabout and say all of them must be removed? just because of the fire? It's a good question. It's my understanding that when the Corps comes in, they will remove the foundations. If you want to keep that foundation, then the burden of testing is on you as the homeowner. Okay. Otherwise, they will remove it, and you won't have to deal with the testing. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. And the burden of the cleanup as well. Uh, the burden of the cleanup? Right, the removal of the, of the foundation. They pick it up and remove it and take it with them. So you're not, if you choose to do this on your own, you have to test the foundation and yeah. you have, have the burden of removing that foundation. If you opt with, with the services of the state and the federal government, they do the cleanup, they remove the foundation. So otherwise, if I don't say anything or request anything, then automatically they will be removed? Yes. And what is left is a hole in the ground? What, what they do is, is I was told that they will uh, remove up to six inches Maybe a little bit more, but I'll defer that to Cal OES and the Army Corps of Engineers. But they leave the site so that you can go ahead and rebuild later. Again, there's no compaction, so that's something that comes later. But and that's something that you would do. But they're leaving you a clean site yep. to so, begin with. So you're saying that you remove six inches, and yet your foundation is 18 inches in the ground. So that which is underground stays. Okay. It all it all goes. Yep. So then there's a hole in the ground. That's what that means. Yeah. Okay. And that's what, that's what I expect to see when I come back to my place. Okay. If, if it's toxic, it's going to go. Okay. Thank you. I just want to jump in real quick because uh, the MAC has received some <coughs> questions prior to this meeting and one uh, germane to this issue, which is, uh, when those foundations are removed, considering that we're moving into the wet season, and we do have often very, very wet seasons here, uh, what about erosion and you know damage to the site? That you know, and, and how how is that going to be compensated or dealt with? I guess, I guess I'll take that. <laughs> so. Um, when it comes to the, like watershed issues, runoff issues and all that, you know, the state has mobilized what we call the bear teams. It's a team that comes from a collection of state agencies to look at the runoff, the wildlife, all the different pieces that, that play into that soil and water piece. Um, I'm looking at you, Andrew, I'm so sorry. Um, so that, that piece has already been mobilized. So they're, they're out there, they're gonna start doing that work to figure out you know, what mitigations need to be done uh, for for that environmental protection. I mean, look, this is California, right? Governor Brown, who do you think cares more about the environment than Governor Brown? So there's just no way that, you know, we're gonna allow some major catastrophe to happen to your environment and, and, and the beautiful place that we all call Mendocino. So, yeah. Thank you. Hello, Danielle, River Valley resident. A lot of the programs is kind of off subject, but I still think it's important for my Red Valley community. A lot of these programs out there have deadlines. Red Cross is stationed up at 132 South State. They're paying prescriptions, medical bills, giving gift cards out. They're only there until tomorrow at 7 p.m. So a lot of people don't know that when I talk to like fire victims. <clears throat> NCO is only doing that for 30 days after 100% containment. This morning we were at 98%. Is that still correct? So a lot of people don't know that large savings account and then the instant gift cards that are available at Mendocino College is only available for that amount of time. EDD, unemployment, whether you're self-employed or not, is only until November 16th. So a lot of people are worried about this right now, and I get that, I totally understand that, but those deadlines are important too for everyone to know about. Does FEMA have a deadline? <laughs> Yeah, so, so 
I'm looking at FEMA a little bit. Um, there hasn't been a deadline set for how, when the end of this incident actually is. You're talking about some stuff that's Red Cross centric, not necessarily. And NCO or savings account that's set up for the credit unit and other places. Yeah. And, and I'll defer to, to the county yeah. to answer that question. Um, but as far as the individual assistance piece from the state and from FEMA, um, that's still open. So you should still be registering for those programs. Uh, you know, we don't have a deadline yet. There's no deadline for that. Okay. And then. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, the, the LAC is still open. We, we would encourage everybody to go to the LAC and, and then, to, to connect with those services. Yeah, Medicine and Poly is great. A little intimidating when you walk in, just going to be honest, but there's yeah. so many professionals in there. They're ready to take you yeah. door by door. I mean, so many awesome. state agencies, federal right. departments. And is that going to stay there only till the 31st? I think there's a set closing date for the last right now. So right now it's open through October 30th, Monday, and it's open on Saturday and Sunday. So that's why we really, that was my you know number one talking point. I appreciate you bringing it up because as deadlines occur, we're going to try to get them out through the county server as we know them. But right now, all of our state and federal partners are committed up to us to be there through October 30th. And really we'll be assessing in the next few days, the number of households who still need to be served and still need that service. We will have some of those services that continue past the 30th, but it's really important that for all those state agencies and federal agencies that deploy people, we don't have a commitment past October 30th at this point. Okay, and then last thing, sorry. A lot of people don't know that don't do Facebook. A lot of fire victims I talk to don't know that the community, larger state, other states, United Kingdom, China has donated donations to us either by gift cards or toilet paper, basic supplies, and they're being housed at two lovely people that have stood up, like April and Melody. We have a Potter Valley unit, the old health clinic, and we have a Ukiah unit between Maurice's and Big Five. All the donations, 98%, there's probably still some here at the Grange, are being stored there and free to every single fire victim and evacuee or damage, inconvenience, for really all for you guys. So please, spread the word. And we'd love to coordinate with you at the, at the end of the meeting. I'm getting here. Thank you. I, I want to clarify the NCO. I, I'm greatly involved in the November 4th fundraiser, and there is no talk of a 30-day time limit of NCO distributing money. That NCO is not... It's over NCO's thing, and it says right on the bottom of the application, it says, after 100% payment, 30 days, it says right on the okay. bottom of the and, and Patty is the CEO of NCO. I just want to say that we have a deadline for applying for the emergency money, and then um, once we give out that money, we will we'll look at what we have left in the pot, and that's typically used for longer-term recovery, and there'll be you know input in how that's used, and. Um, so it's just the emergency check that we put a deadline on because we can't move forward after that. So, so please apply, ncoinc.org, or we have applications in the back. Um, I'm back to the, the tree issue. Um, we were in the Grave Fire in, in July, and my first impulse was I wanted to cut down all those unsightly black, dead-looking trees. And now a number of things have come back that I didn't expect. In fact, I was looking at some some um, manzanita, and I said, oh, I'm going to cut all this down. And then I looked, and there were green buds on it. This is from July. So you're not going to see that till next spring. But what these trees are going to do, these dead trees and branches are going to do during the winter, is they're going to slow the fall of the rain down, and you're going to it's going to help mitigate erosion and protect your property. So. Put up with the ugliness on your property if you possibly can. If it's a danger, if it's threatening an existing structure, if it's threatening a road, yeah, you can you, know, you can live it. And, and you know, safety is important. Power lines, anything else. But if it's not threatening that, I would strongly suggest leaving leaving all that, whether it's orchard trees or or um, wild trees or anything like that. And I'm hoping. I'm just wondering if the state is advising people that because I think. My impulse was to cut down all this ugly stuff so I didn't have to think about it and just to counsel people about that. That 
in three months, in six months, they're going to be glad of what they left. Oaks, oaks take up to a year to, for you to even tell what, what um, was dead on them. The black trunks, you know, the thick outer bark of an oak tree, the trunk will be all black, but the cambium is destroyed in some cases. In some cases it will be in this fire, in some cases it won't be. Sometimes it was moving fast, sometimes it was moving slow, so, you know, just be patient with, with removing your, your um, trees and shrubs. I would like to mention as well, uh, Part of what we have written into our contract, we realize that a lot of trees that look damaged are not dead. So one of the things that's written into our contract is that a certified arborist will be on site with the contractors to evaluate those trees that are immediately around the homes to make sure that we are not taking down trees that are still alive and may recover this spring. So we're looking specifically at trees that are a hazard to the immediate piece of property to the home. And those ones will be evaluated. If they are dead and the arborist says take them out, we will remove them. Uh, but if they're marked as trees that are still alive and will recover, we will not be removing those unless they pose a direct hazard via large broken limbs or those types of things. My name is Chris. I have a couple of questions. The first one is directed to the SBA. I'm not sure where they went. Um, the question is, is, can I use the loan money to buy a new property? Um, we're we're going to see if the other one is still here, uh, but, but we can follow up on that question if not. Let me ask one more while we're waiting. Um, this is towards planning, I think. So is there going to be any loosening towards splitting parcels or making more parcels or more housing for other people? We have a, we have a general plan that we have to abide by. Um, and so as far as creating more parcels, again, there are a lot of issues with regards to long-range planning. Again, we'd have to coordinate with the MAC. We'd have to look at water availability. The idea is to rebuild what you have today, not use this as an opportunity to create subdivisions. All right, we're close to making his way to the microphone. Yeah, we'll get back to you on your SBA loan question. On the property got burnt, like fences, cross fences, side fences. Are you guys dealing with that, or do I deal with that? And is it hazardous waste that I have to deal with? So my understanding, and we'll work with FEMA to determine exactly what's eligible on the property. But typically, it's that uh, immediate footprint of the primary house and the improved property around that. And that's when we do our initial evaluations to determine what we're cleaning up and what the contractor is responsible for. We'll have FEMA with us to determine what's eligible. So if we have a uh, close by health building or we have uh, fences that are, are melted or destroyed on the property that are close enough, if FEMA gives us the authorization to remove those, we will. But that's going to be up to FEMA to determine what's eligible. We'll take everything they say is eligible. So the vehicle process that we have in place right now, we'll be working, I'm, I'm not sure specific to this county, but either with uh, the local county may have a program to recover those or with Highway Patrol. And what we need to do first is ID the vehicles. So we'll follow on and make sure that those are ID'd and correctly captured within the system as destroyed vehicles until we get that certification from either the county or the Highway Patrol. Uh, we will not touch those. Once that's received, we will remove those as scrap. All right, so do you, do you need that before you go on the property? I'll go ahead and address the issue of the vehicles. That is a task that is handled by the County Code Enforcement Division, which they handle the vehicle abatement program. So what they'll go, they'll be working with these folks to try to identify VIN numbers. The idea is to extinguish those and work with the DMV and work with law enforcement to make sure that it is properly disposed of. So again, that's something that staff will be working with in conjunction with the Corps of Engineers and FEMA and all the interested parties out there. Okay, and the second thing I wanted to ask about, we'll make a statement on this. I appreciate the group that's volunteered to try and improve the community, but I just want to get back in my home, get back to my life. So all these things, these improvements with everything you want to do, I just want to make sure that they're not going to interfere with me getting into my home if I'm not got the money I want to deal with putting up solar panels and stuff. I heard about you can change the parcels, wear out, or you can try and fit it all off. I just want to build my home and get back to my life. 
that is the goal of the county, is to get you back in onto your property as soon as possible. If you choose to rebuild where you're at, again, that's the idea. We're not looking at changing uh, the densities or rearranging parcels or doing solar access. We need to get you back onto your property. Again, the MAC has long range planning ideas. Again, that's something for a different discussion. Um, but we're working under the current land use regulations to get you back onto the property as soon as possible. All right, thank you. Thank you time, guys. Thanks. My question was actually about vehicles, which you've mostly answered, but I'd like to know if we can expedite it by collecting the VIN numbers on the vehicles that we do know that are on our property. If you have that information, one of the things that uh, I'll ask that you do is you provide that to our staff in the back, uh, especially when you're filling out those right of entry forms. Indicate what you have on there so that you label it as something to be removed. And if you have the VIN numbers, provide that. Again, it'll make our job easier because what code enforcement will need to do is to go out onto the site, check to see if it's a VIN number. In some cases, the VIN number has been melted. melted <laughs> and so it's a destroyed vehicle. What, what the vehicle abatement program does is it works hand in hand with the state to remove those cars. And I guess the best way that I can describe that is we want to remove the potential for a car to be labeled as missing or stolen. It has, no, to, be I understand. Account, has to be accounted for. So that's what they're going to be doing. Okay, thank you. DMV is out of Mendocino College. Okay, I've been reminded that DMV is out at Mendocino College, so that's another contact to work with. Nash, don't go away. I have a question for you. <laughs> so is the county still going to be um, dealing with Class K permits? In other words, to use Class K as a rebuild? Yes. Yes. Okay, so everybody in the room should be aware of what that is because um, it's a great source for you to go on your rebuild with a Class K permit. I won't go into a lot of detail with it, but just write it down, look it up, do it with the county. I'm currently building my house with a Class K permit, and it's worked very well. So I'm just going to... Before you wanna... before you go down that route, I would encourage everybody to talk to the building official about going down that route. Uh, again, you know, and also talk to your insurance companies to see if they will allow for that. Again, because... There is the, what we call the Uniform Building Code, or actually it's referred to as the California Building Code, which is a certain standard, and then Class K is a different standard. So you really need to be talking to your insurance companies about their requirements to be able to rebuild at the current building code. Class K was a re relaxation of the building code that occurred back in the 1980s. Again, all I can do is caution you to talk to your insurance companies. If any of you know me, you can talk to me as well about that. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question is for Carrie Brown. Oh, no. Carrie, Foxy. Um, we talked about on the phone that you have one year from the time your house burns down to deal with your septic system without having to replace a system, how is the county going to deal with that and what did you uncover with the State Water Resource Board relative to that, if you have yet? Okay, I'm going, we think there's some confusion that you had as to what the, the regional board is doing right now. Nash has been in contact with them. The one year is um, with septic. Um, individual burn down homes. Um, I believe there's a grandfather with that. If they haven't been, if the septic system, system has not been destroyed, but Nash, you want to, or do we have environmental health here? Trace, where are you? <coughs> um, I hate to say it right, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, I do know we're going to be as flexible as we can. We understand this is not a normal situation. Um, so I don't intend to, to hold anybody to a, a one year uh, due date when we're 
in, in such a abnormal situation. Uh, we want people to, to get back to their lives, to, to get things rolling again. Um, so, so we're going to look at all those policies and wherever we can be flexible we are and help people get back on their feet. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, I don't have a question so much as some information to offer. I, my name is Carol, I live here in the Valley, but I, I also deliver the mail in Hopland. And last week I talked to someone at Hopland Field Station, which is part of UC Davis, and they said that they are extremely sorry for what's happened to our community and they want to help our community. And they're trying to put together some programs like reseeding wildlife lands. Um, they said there's still time this year before the rains to get new grass growing, which would be a big help as far as, you know, when the rains do come. And I, I talked to Katrina Fry about, about it, and so hopefully she'll be able to get more information as the field station comes up with what programs they're going to do. It's still, they're kind of still in the works, but know that that that, that their help is out there too for restoring wild wildlands and the grasslands. I just want to add that we will be working with our local uh, and state and federal partners around creative ideas like this. So I have a lot of cards here if you want to connect me with someone, but we certainly will be reaching out to UC Davis as well. I just want to say uh, what I was told about deadlines. I went to the college and the FEMA lady who was sitting in front said if you don't apply in the first two months, you cannot get into the system. From the, from the end of the declaration period. So FEMA does have a, an end date, but that's based on the end of the declaration period. So we're still in the declaration period now. It's not been officially closed. That's still working with CAL FIRE to look at what the actual incident date is. So right now the incident date's still open. So eventually though we will have those dates and we'll publish those as soon as we have them. Okay. I know I said I'd stick around. The county has somewhat of a 911 situation north of here. I have to leave. If you have a question for the sheriff's office, please go to our Facebook page and ask me, and I'd be happy to answer later on. Thank you very much. I don't know. That doesn't have to be a fire service question. Hi, my name is Deanna. I have two questions. One for billing and planning and one for tax division. Um, when the Lake County fire happened, they were allowing people to let their friends and stay on their properties and trailers if they needed a place to stay. Is that happening here? If I have a friend that wants to stay on my property and trailer and I have a 30 amp, I have a subject system and I can detain them, is that possible? So one of the things that we discussed this morning at the Board of Supervisors is an urgency ordinance that we're looking at bringing to the board next week that would allow for the establishment on a temporary basis with an administrative permit, a recreational vehicle, travel trailer, mobile home to be placed on a property that would allow for people to either establish them on the subject property that's been burned or on another property, again, for a three-year period. But that permits over a thousand dollars. There is a cost, yes. Yeah. Okay, so to help somebody that isn't available, unless I wanted to pay the thousand dollars. Well, there is a cost to do this, to process this. Okay. Well, Lake County waived that with that Valley Fire. So I was just wondering what this county is going to do. Yeah, I've not been authorized to waive these. Okay, second question. To my understanding, if you don't have a house in your property, you're not required to pay for, uh, house property tax. You only to pay property tax, but not with structure. Is that correct? I'll defer that to our uh, assessor. So, <clears throat> could you repeat the question, please? So, you have property tax and you have structure tax. So, if they don't have a home on their property. They don't have to pay that structure tax. Am I correct? What we're going to do is we're going to issue corrected tax bills. You see the improvements removed, but you'll see that the land value will remain. But so they'll get refunds what they've already paid since the fire. True. If we, if, well, but like I said, if you file a damage report, we will defer that first payment on December. It's due on December 10th. 
If you don't and you choose to pay that first installment, yes, there will be a refund process for Okay, that. that's why people don't know they don't pay taxes. There's no structure there. Thank you. My question, on oh, Karen Hart, my question also is about property taxes. Um, at the Mendocino College, I was given a, a form by the assessor's office to have it reassessed due to the damage prior. Yes. Well, I'm thinking of alternatives, like if I fill in the form, the assessment will be reduced by the dwelling. Yes. But if I choose to pay my current, I mean, how is that being reassessed later on after my structure is built? Will it be assessed to current high market values? No. Or would it be pre-fire? Pre what will happen is you construct your property, reconstruct your property, we will be going out and we will be looking at the value that's added back. But we will add it back at its original Prop 13 value plus the trend. So say for example, you had $100,000 in improvements on your property tax bill, but your, your improvements are worth half a million. So what we will do is we will remove the structures at 100,000 and we will add those back at the same 100,000 if you build it within a year. If you don't, then the Prop 13 trend will be added to that, but we will not put it back at market. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. i just like to ask, I know there's a lot of side conversations going on, but I'd like to just ask the people, please, if you need to talk with your neighbor, move outside so the people that are still in the room can hear. And I also, and away from the door over here, I also, um, Yolanda is back in the room now, and Chris had a question posed to her earlier about the application of SBA funds for purchasing another property. I just want to take that. Okay, thank you. Yes, I answered the individual question, but we thought we should open it up to, so everyone would get that um, the benefit of hearing what the answer was. And you can use an SBA approved SBA loan for relocation. So we do have some different components that can help you in your individual situation if you want to relocate can use your, your approved SBA loan to relocate to a new property. Hello, uh, I live on Tom K Road, a little bit north of the Fries, my house burned down, and I want to make you aware of the danger when the next rain comes, because many trees which were holding up with brush and stuff, they have a uh, P2 sprayed on it and basically they're hanging over the power line right now so I think this is to point it out it's a danger coming soon that there will be landslides and there will be falling trees coming up so th it's kind of a priority and I thank you very much the county who came with the chipper today, and they did small brush. But uh, the trees I'm talking about is about a size, maybe six foot around, 180 foot tall, and it's kind of hanging, dead, hanging over the line, so. Um, I'm not sure that the little chipper can handle that. <laughs> I do want to assure you that we have raised, I'm sorry our Cal OES kind of approach just stepped out because we have raised the Tomkey Creek is such an urgency at every level of our state and federal conversations over the last few days and we are trying to come in with as much urgency to get beyond the chipper and really solve that problem. But thank you. I think as much as you keep us informed as of the immediate dangers, we're very aware of the need before the next rain to do as much as we can. But um, we, um, we're sorry we don't have the solution yet tonight, but we are, we are in conversations daily to address those needs. They were already assessed. I'm sorry for asking uh, one more thing, because pg e actually has a power pole on my property, and because my pole burned, now this, the pole is kind of leaning towards my neighbor's house, and um, I asked pg e if they would be so kind and replace my own pole too to help their own pole and they said no way we're not going to do that. I 
you know my cell number. Yeah. You know my business number. Give me a call. Okay. And leave you know leave me your number. I'll work on that with PG. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. And someone in a yellow vest is tracking you down. <laughs> oh, I got it. All right. My concern is with wells in the um, Mohawk Trail area where I live. My well house destroyed. My well was destroyed. I had the people out there, the well people, and it seems like I got more confusion back there than when I started. I, they're telling me I cannot remove fallen debris. There's nothing. It's just wood that the house, the well property was, but everything else is destroyed. I'd like them to be out there as soon as possible, and they would, but I don't have a thought. I don't know if I'm even allowed to touch a piece of wood on the cement slab that it's on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if I can recap that, you're concerned about the well itself and being yes. able to reutilize that well. Right. Okay. Um, we have environmental health here, but what I would like is that when you fill out that right of entry form, you put the information on there with regards to the well so that when the appropriate cleanup folks are out there, they're not going to go ahead and disturb that well. Okay, no, the well has been destroyed. Everything is destroyed. The computer, yeah, the bladder, the whole thing is gone. But um, unfortunately, I've read the Valley Water, but I'm sure a lot of people don't and depend on their wells. And I'm sure I'm not the only one asking this question. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I'm still back to square one. I don't know what to do. I think for the issue of damaged wells, we're just going to have to take it on a, on a case by case basis. Some wells might be able to be uh, re sleeved if just a portion of the casing has, has burned and the sanitary seal is still intact. Uh, maybe it can be, be re sleeved. Uh, and if it can't, the, the well might need to be uh, properly destroyed and, and another well. Well, well, the well is. Not properly destroyed. It's destroyed. Um, the sleeve is destroyed. They, what people were there, they're willing to do the work. But when he says fire victims will come first. Um, but he says we're piling up. Okay. So now I'm. I want to pull this stuff away from there because it's nothing but a slab with a hole in the ground now. And they will fix it. They will do the whole thing. Get it back to where it was before this fire started. But I have to have some sort of assurance that, yes, I could remove a piece of burnt wood. Okay, so that's a access and debris removal access. I think to be able to answer your question is provide your contact information so we can get back to you on that. To environmental health, I'm sorry, to who? Um, I'm back again. Um, in terms of the rains coming, have I missed news as to when Cal, um, it's not Cal Recycle, it's the Army Corps, is going to be doing their work? And what about rains coming? Um, I had my mitigation person suggest tarping the debris, the debris field that's directly adjacent to my house. Do you have opinions about that? Everybody's afraid they're going to do something that's going to endanger their qualification for the state, for the program, the cleanup program. So I have no recommendations. I, I, if you tarp, that's not going to keep us from coming on to, to remove anything. Would it be um, helpful to keep things from leaching further into the soil? I can't speak to that. That's not my area of expertise. That would be more for uh, an environmental chemist or, or an environmental engineer to, to talk about what that would do, if that would be useful. One of our goals, though, is we understand the rain is coming. We want to get this completed as quick as possible. So again, our goal is by this weekend to have our crews start mobilizing their equipment in the area. So we'll be confirming that the trucks are meeting safety codes, all those things, so we're ramped up. And then as soon as we get enough of the, um, from DTSC, if we get those properties that are available that have ROEs, we'll be set up and ready to move in as fast as possible. Uh, and we'd like to get this completed 
with all the expediency. So we have uh, brought in two contractors um, that are going to be exercising in the four areas. And are you going to give priority to people who must have a standing house next to a big debris field? So priority is going to be you is going to be in conjunction with the, the county and, and uh, with Cal OES. So they're setting up a phasing and the idea is to be as efficient as possible with the removal so we can get done as fast as we can. Okay. Um, so we'll work with them on whatever they set where they want us to go and where we're collecting the ROE so we can be efficient with the process. And once we submit our application, will we get some sense of where we are on that list? That's typically the process. I'm not sure how that's going to be put out, but we would like to communicate that with directly with the county from the Corps of Engineers side with our contractor. So as we set up our phasing maps and show where we're going to be, that'll be communicated and then it'll be up to the county and the city officials to communicate that out to the public. Thank you. Hi, I just have a couple questions. My first one is going to be for people that move trailers onto their property and incur this thousand dollar fee. That you're assuming their house is burnt down, the power drop is now gone, so these people are going to move a trailer onto their property, what are they going to do for power? Will they have access to a temporary power, or the ability to get a temporary power pole without issuing engineer plans and going forward with building right away? Okay, let me go ahead and address that. Again, the idea is to get you back onto your property sure. as soon as possible. So. Typically, and I'll say typically what is done is you need to file for a building permit, get a temporary power pole, the administrative permit. This administrative permit will allow you to live on that property without having to have a building permit for a permanent house. This will allow you up to three years on that property. Again, with that, as a sidebar, you'll be able to come in and apply for a temporary power pole. Okay, what will be their incurred cost at that point? They'll pay the $1,000 in order to move the trailer onto the property, so what will be that extra cost logis logistics-wise just to get the permit, and not including the cost of the panel, the pole, a contractor to put it in, all that, and I think that's something people aren't going to realize is going to be a problem for Again, them. that's something that I'm going to ask that you speak with the building department about, okay. specifically because everything is based on valuation and what you're doing. So I would encourage you to talk to the building department because they will tell you what the cost of that drop, that cost of the power pole. Okay. My only other concern is with insurance for the residents. Um, on your insurance, you have a line for demolition for your property. Um, that pays for the house to be removed. Are you guys going to stick to that guideline? Or are you going to dig into the code upgrade and the different lines of insurance that allow them to build the structure they need to build today? I'm sorry if I'm going too far with all this. No, these are all good questions. Again, when you rebuild today, you're rebuilding to the 2016 building. Right, and that's, that's what code upgrade and extended coverage are in your insurance for. But on the late fire, we found that a lot of people were, I'm going to nicely say, missing that when they went to go actually rebuild. And the bills that they were getting from Cal Recycle were existentially larger than private contractors. So I guess just my concern for my community is not to see them with their stick homes turn into bonding camera and trailers. And I hate to say it like that, but I think it needs to be said. Again, these are the, these are the types of things that Cal OES addressed. They, they will go ahead and cover the cost of all of this. Um, there is that line item in the insurance that deals with that item. Okay, anything uh, up to that item, your insurance will have to cover that and return back to the county and to uh, OES and to uh, the removal team. <coughs> but as far as if you don't have insurance, sure. Okay, then again, it's something that's covered by Cal OES. Yeah, that's a whole other deal. Yeah. I'm just more concerned with the people that are going to have to put in fire suppression systems and God forbid sealed sockets and wildfire windows and all the fun things that you'll have, you'll have to rebuild to the current code. So and that's years. why your insurance has a code upgrade provision. So all that will be less. The only thing that you guys are going to take is just literally the demo line. And that's all they have to worry about? That's basically what is is the debris removal. So you're, that's, that's all that will be collected from the insurance. Okay. You'll be able to rebuild, use your insurance for that. Again, you have a code upgrade which allows you to come up Absolutely. with current code. So I guess my next, will we be able to do private rooms? 
removal of our debris. In other words, if I get a company to come out and do my grid inspection for heavy, lead, heavy metal and asbestos and the different things we're checking for, will I be allowed to do this on this fire also? Again, that the burden of that cost is going to be on you. Absolutely. Okay, cool. It could be several thousand dollars for you to do that. And it will be. And you is will, and you, and you will allow us to do it. Your contractor will have to be certified to meet the uh, standards of the federal government okay. to be able to do that. And then there's the cost of transporting and those toxic materials out of county. When you say meet the federal standards, exactly what do you mean? Because I did it on the Valley Fire. So I went to logistics. We were one of the first companies in there. I did private removal. We did building. I'm still doing building. So what are the logistics as far as... I, I would recommend that you go to the FEMA website, the Army Corps website, and maybe these folks can speak to that, but there are certain standards, certain certifications you have to meet to be able to be that type of contractor. Okay, yeah, because of the late fire, we didn't have to do that. What we were required to do was to have a company that met all those standards come in and test it, Prove that you had a clean site, and from there you just had standards of removals. Yeah, again, I'll defer to the Army. Sure. So in this instance right now, we're still working on exactly what that looks like, but the process would be, and our concern would be, as long as the standards by a private contractor meet exactly what we're doing, then right. you'll be allowed to do it on your own. The reasoning behind that is by we clean up these three properties and this fourth one that's in the middle is cleaned to a lower standard, well, then that could affect everyone else. Yeah, and when we did it, we had to do initial testing and you had to do after the fact testing. So you weren't getting out of that unless it was 100% clean. So, you know, and beyond that, the only thing you did was simply put it into a truck, wrap it in plastic and send it off. So beyond the initial testing, there really wasn't a whole lot going on. And that's going to be the, the case here. So as soon as we determine exactly what standards, and we're basing our standards off California Air Quality Board uh, initial testing. Once we have those developed and can provide those to our contractor, okay. those same standards will be published so that if local people want to do it with their own private contractor, as long as they're meeting that same set of standards, okay. they're more than welcome to do that and yeah. they're fine to do it. Okay, so we tried to pull a demo permit this last week and we're unable to, that's why I'm asking. So our local pro process is not approved yet for that process yet. We're working with the whole region of counties that were affected so we can have as common a process, of a process as possible. Okay, but FEMA's already in working on it. So it's just for the private people we're trying to put it together? Or? Uh, actually, the only entity that's here so far is uh -huh. uh, DTSC doing the initial household hazardous waste. Sure. And then the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is working with us for the next phase of the Okay, so private insurer, or private contractors will be able to do it though. Yes, there's actually a process right now where you as a contractor can sign up to be a FEMA subcontractor through oh. their subcontractors. Okay. And then there also will be, an, if, you, if you opt out of that process, we will have a local process. It's just not approved yet. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. I, I just want to piggyback on some of the issues that were just raised by this gentleman. Uh, I've heard, and I don't know anything about this, but I've heard that in some of the other fires in the past that, uh, that uh, PG&E has you know, paid some forms of compensation or put out money to, to add to improvements to the utilities. And since, and I'm not pointing a finger, but since it, it seems pretty clear, correct me if I'm wrong, Fire Chief, that um, I've heard pretty much that this fire started when a transformer went down in Potter Valley. I know the, co the official cause of the fire is still under investigation. Yes, uh, okay. So, so. But I... Yeah, Chief, Chief Gonzalez, I think I believe. Yeah, because I've, I've heard a number of eyewitness reports that they saw that go down in an explosion and that was the source of the fire. My point being, um, I haven't heard anybody talk about the utilities role in this rebuilding process and I, I would really like to draw them in and I don't know how that works and I don't know if that's a question uh, Tammy or, or for Nash or if it's more of a political question, Carrie, but I'd like to hear some comment on that. You know, I, I won't be able to answer that tonight, but we certainly have worked with PG&E through our uh, response process to the disaster. They were involved daily in the response processes, and um, so I'll follow up on the next steps. Hi, um, we 
close our home on Humphrey Road, and our hope is to put a trailer there so that we can get back to our property. We went to the planning department today, and um, we were told that we had to wait for the Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday. Um, they've already put a new power pole in, the wire's there, the pole's ready, so we're ready for a pole with a meter. And I'm hoping that you're going to address at Tuesday's meeting that particular thing also, not just the permit to put the trailer on the property, but how long do we have to wait for pg e to come in? We actually have an appointment with pg e to come to our property tomorrow at 10 a.m., but we did go to the planning department today to try and uh, do whatever the process is. And we were told there was nothing we could do until the Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday. So I want to make sure that's going to be addressed. Not just the trailer on the property, but the power. Do you mean like a motor trailer or a trailer recreational that you pull? When yeah, you say well, trailer. I mean, at this point, the size trailer we bought, it's a home. I mean, I, I, I understand. What, what the Board of Supervisors is doing is looking at urgency ordinances to help people just like you. Right. To put them back on their property as soon as possible. Okay. pg e question, I don't think we can answer when they can come and inspect, uh -huh. if that's what you're saying. But um, there, there is an ordinance in Mendocino County, I think it was explained earlier, it's a violation to have someone living in a coach or a trailer on your property without an active building permit. And that's why we came to the planning department today sure. to try and access that and, and follow the law. And we're working on it. Okay. okay. So I just and, want to make sure that the pg e temporary power pole is going, we were also told that it was going to be discussed at the Board of Supervisors meeting. So I, I, I want to make sure that that do, is included. Okay. Um, Nan Nan's just going to talk for just a minute, but I want you to know I've been all over my district, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people are living in trailers and RVs, <laughs> and those are their homes right now. And we're trying to follow the and, rules. So. But code enforcement's not going to come after you. Right. We want to help the victims yeah. in this fire. Right. So um, we're going to be active that way. Okay. I'm going to let Nash talk about his end of it. But the board will continue working on these urgency ordinance. And your first district supervisor, her name is Carrie Brown. She would love to hear your ideas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so again, the plan is to take the urgency ordinance to the board next Tuesday. Okay. It is going through a process right now because we also have to deal with state law as far as uh, does it meet certain tests. Mm -hmm. So we're going through that process. I, before coming over here, I met the county council to go over the logistics of the ordinance. Okay. The idea is to move that ordinance to the board next week, have the board adopt and approve that ordinance so that we can go ahead and allow you to establish a temporary travel trailer or trailer coach or RV on your property. Okay. The building department will work with you on a temporary power pole. Okay. Again, typically what has happened in the past is you get these permits when you have an active building permit on the site to right. temporarily live on the property while constructing. The idea is that a lot of you will not be able to get architects and engineers to design plans in just a few days. This is a long-term effort. Yes. The idea is to get you an opportunity to live on your property in a travel trailer that can either be connected to a working septic or be self-contained. And as I've said, the building department will work with you on trying to establish that power. You do need to reach out to PG&E as far as their requirements. We, we can't have, answer for yes, PG&E. We, we have, but when we were at the planning department today, they said, well, no, no temporary power. Not yet, because so, we don't have an ordinance yet. Yeah. I'm hoping that Tuesday, after your meeting, that you'll have an ordinance. That's our, our goal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Howdy. My name is Steve. Um, I have a question for the local water agency. I know some people are on wells, uh, but some people have ag water and um, also local water agency. And a lot of people have a meter box. And when they get back to their property, they're going to find the meter lid is turned sideways and the meter is turned off. 
Um, most of the time, if the valve is on your side of the property, you're allowed to turn it on without calling the um, water agency. Uh, usually, uh, from my experience, if the valve is on their side, then you need to call them. Could you uh, go through the proper procedure of uh, being able to raise a hose bib off of your meter so you can bring something to your property to uh, be able to live in? Sure. The meter vid lids turned sideways means that during the fire we were turning your service off so that we wouldn't waste water. Uh, we were losing 4,000 gallons a minute. So that's an active service. Call us, we'll hook you up. Not a problem. We'll turn it on. And you can hook a hose bib. Um, we are going to be working with the county to require that you have a backflow device. If you're going to hook up a travel trailer, travel trailer is a potential cross connection. Um, what that means is that whatever the county allows you to put on your property, we're happy with. If you have a cross connection control device, and you're going to need it anyway when you, if you rebuild with a house that requires sprinklers, you'll need it anyway. But yeah, make an appointment. We'll hook you up. Okay, so um, the best idea is to not touch the uh, the the main turn on valve and just call you guys when you're ready to. Um, so that means that you need to have the PVC up to a hose bit done when you come to um, turn the water on. Uh, my recommendation is you give us a call, we'll come out and meet you, and tell you the best way to get your water on. Great, thank you. Hello, my name is Maria. Our home is at the end of Jacobs Road on Terrell Creek, and I have a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt, I believe, uh, said that the Department of Toxic Substances Control is in the area, and uh, they were, are cleaning up, but they're working south from Fisher Lake. And my question, and then they're going to be uh, going uh, other places, but uh, Jenkins Road, it sounds like they're not going to be getting to that for a while. And one thing that I wanted to say about that is we have a bridge that burned on Jenkins Road, and the steel that is still there, the, the sheeting's gone, the steel that's still there has been tested. Bob Perkowski had it tested, and apparently that steel is toast. It's going to have to completely be replaced. So right now what is there is uh, a graded um, gouge that went through in, down into the creek and up the other side. That's how pg and and so forth has been getting through. But when we get rain, this uh, temporary road is going to turn back into a creek and people aren't going to be able to, or you, especially big trucks, I should think, not be able to get in and out of there to, you know, take things out. So um, I would suggest that perhaps uh, getting, getting, um, well, <laughs> well, that would be really nice, but my, my thought for the moment is that getting to Jenkins Road would have some uh, urgency about it. Um, you know, there is some flexibility on our scope of work, so now that we know that, I mean, we can, we can note it and try to get into that area sooner than later. I mean, right now, I mean, the weather report's showing clear skies for the next week, but you know that's gonna change once we get into November. So, uh, my crew leader's in the back. We can write that down. Let's get your address. And then maybe we can focus our efforts in that area, uh, like in the next week. Yeah, th this creek is, as I understand it, this is uh, the North Fork of the Russian River. And the, the uh, graded uh, gouge that they put in there has been graveled, so it's it's good to travel right okay. now, but right. it won't be long. Okay. Um, so, and the other thing uh, that I am asking about is the vehicles. Uh, we have, I have four vehicles there, and I have no bin numbers from the DMV and all of that, but there were several other vehicles and some trailers there that we don't have bin numbers on, so how, how do you folks handle that? 
Um, I would like to kind of do a little detour here on our questions and answers. And I, I believe we addressed vehicles earlier and the DMV is located at the Disaster Assistance Center. They've got some real specific protocols for that. Are they here tonight as well? <laughs> the local assistance center, which is at the college? Yes. And, and so they will be able to deal with that. What I, what I want to do now is to see if the questions have been great, but we're needing to refocus toward the other room where a lot of the people are here to answer specific questions. And so if there are people in the audience who would like to quietly adjourn to that back room and start asking questions, that might be a good thing to do. And we will try to address the last three questioners in line, ma'am, including yourself. Okay, because this right. is not a DMV question. This is a question of how how the people taking the, the vehicles off the property handle the vehicles that have no uh, no DMV information. Okay, we need to collect your information. There's a table in the back. Uh, again, vehicle abatement is handled by the Code Enforcement Division. And again, any information you can provide them with the bid numbers or just let them know what you have. They will come out to the property and assess it and, and help you with the paperwork to remove those vehicles. Who is they? Thank you. Who is they? Code Enforcement Division. Code Enforcement Division within Planning and Building. Hi, so my question is about the RV on the property. And my question is, do you still need an administrative permit if you have a building permit in process? to bring an RV to live in while you rebuild your primary residence. Okay, if we apply the current rule, you do need an administrative permit if you're gonna live on the property with the building permit. Okay. The purpose of having this new approach is that this approach is not tied to a building permit immediately, but it allows you to obtain a building permit within the next three years. Okay, so my other question is then if someone, for example, lost their home, you said that someone could have a guest come and live in an RV on their property temporarily, I think, right? The idea so, is we're looking at density, so we're looking at that was my one, question about one density. unit, primary, a secondary unit, and again, the idea would be that you can have up to two trailers meeting the density, and the way our ordinance will work is that we're looking at accommodations for things like contractors that are tied to the property, rebuilding your home. That even a contractor from, let's say, out of the area needs housing can actually come onto that site Great. and use that, that administrative permit. So somebody could potentially have a trailer for themselves for their home, a trailer for their guest house, and then a trailer for a friend that they're letting stay there? Well, it would be a contractor. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Jeff. I have a question for the Army Corps about um, uh, uh, pools. How do you deal with in-ground gunite pools um, that are next to a destroyed residence? There's debris in the pool, the decks are cracked. It, or is that something that's pulled out? Do you just bring up the, the crack so, concrete or? So right now damage? we are we're we're not touching pools. Uh, we're leaving those as is and putting a fence around them. Okay. Um, we can check with FEMA if, if that's going to be made eligible. Then if the homeowner wanted their pool to remove, be removed, and FEMA said that was eligible, then we would remove that pool. But at this time we're we're not removing pools. We're leaving them and fencing them off so they're not a safety hazard. Okay. And debris in the pool, ash, uh, wood. Uh, stuff that was from the residents. We're, we're leaving that in, in place right now for fear that they're trying to get that out with damage this structure. Okay, and then that, how does that other debris get removed if it's passing under hazmat waste? Uh, we're still determining what that process is going to be, okay. how we're going to get that out, or if that's going to be something that will be done after the fact. Okay, but if you see scorched concrete you, and you're pulling out full foundations, and you see scorched concrete around the pool, are you pulling out that concrete that's you know, decking around the pool? We will if FEMA gives us that as an eligible piece to pull out and the homeowner wants it done. Okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adrian Diaz. I live on Tomkai, well, technically on Tomkai, but my property butts up into uh, Rudy Lightsville property and the cold side of Fisher Lake. So I've been here the whole time listening and I want to make sure that I have a few questions, but 
that they would be general questions that apply to everybody. And some of these weren't answered. And my first question is, is the degree, is it going to be tested by lab analysis? Because it seems to me that it's just going to be a presumption by the Department of Sub uh, Toxic Substances Control that it's just going to be presumed to be hazardous. We will be testing the debris. So if we can determine that the debris is not toxic, that reduces the, the burden for removing it. We can be more efficient and less cost. And so we will be testing debris on every single property as we go. And that's, we're determining what exactly that looks like and what standards we're going to have to test to. And those will be based on California regulations and quality board for, for all of that. But as we determine what level, that's the level we'll handle with that. So if it's not toxic, we'll handle it as non-toxic debris. I appreciate that because that really drastically changes how that material is processed and the particularities of how it can be removed and transported. So I wasn't sure if it was going to be tested prior. Additionally, um, what happened to Cal Recycle? So Cal Recycle was used by the state of California in the 2015 fires to do the removal. They felt, uh, in conjunction with FEMA, that Cal Recycle didn't have enough resources to do everything that was burn in this fire, it's much larger than before. So right now, Cal Recycle is actually focused on, I believe, uh, two or three other counties, Nevada County, Yuba County, um, and possibly down in Orange County in Southern California. Um, because they were overloaded and didn't have the resources, the state was able to ask FEMA for federal help, and that brought the Corps of Engineers in to manage the, these four counties. And has the Army Corps of Engineers had experience dealing with these type of situations, the same as Cal Recycle? Yes, we have. So part of what we're doing is the Corps of Engineers, the contractors that we're bringing in to do this, to the fullest extent possible, are hiring local contractors. So we're going to be using a lot of the same contractors that are from this area that dealt with the 2015 fire. So they have the resources, they, they know they're local to the area. Okay, and then, so I got a question, I guess, for the whole group as well. And it was brought up with pg uh, not being here, but also a question, why were none of the representatives from uh, the insurance groups asked to be here? Were they asked, why, why? Because I've been calling my insurance rep every day. I, like, I speak with her, my gesture, almost you know, several times a day. And I'm not quite sure why no representative from any of the homeowners insurance groups are here. So uh, we certainly came to just give an overview of what we're doing with recovery at the Local Assistance Center. The State Insurance Commissioner has a seat there, and we've invited at the Local Assistance Center, if a local insurance provider feels they have enough clients that they want to come, there's actually places where they are there outside, in the area where, where people are being served at the Local Assistance Center. I meant today. I meant why wouldn't everyone here today to address questions and get their uh, position and feedback. Okay. Hey guys, we're, we're, uh, this is our first meeting and uh, that's a really good question and uh, maybe for the next meeting or the one after that we'll one be more. able to... Have one more? Sure. This right of entry form, if it's signed, can I as a homeowner later void that contract for whatever reason? And additionally, is this right of entry contract, does it have a hold harmless writer on it? that would uh, basically hold all government entities and agencies free of any responsibility for damage to my property. So can I avoid it for whatever reason? And secondarily, is there a whole harmless rider attached to it that's trying to be kind of like, you know, snuck under the table where uh, anything can happen and nobody's at fault? I'm happy to take your information. Uh, we don't. We don't have uh, necessarily okay. the answer tonight. All right. Um, All right. I'm going to take this as our last question, just because we would like to have enough time for people to move in, talk to these individuals. So I'm going to take this question, and then Supervisor Brown. I have. A, I have. A, my name is Richard Rhodes, and I have a question. It's been touched on about slabs and testing. I didn't get the, the definitive on this. Why well, have the slab tested and it comes back clean? But the site is otherwise contaminated. Will the contamination be cleaned or not? Our understanding is not by the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers. Only if you go with your own private process. Yeah. 
that. So you, I, can, you can have a slab that's clean, and the debris around it that's dirty. And the slab is clean, it's test clean, or it's test uh, that it's not burned to the point of, of being toxic. All right? But the rest of it you won't clean up. That's, that's what we've understood from our discussion so far. We will be meeting this week to get that even more, well, to get it clarified. And we'll be very clear on our um, public information. Right. But that is what we've been told so far doesn't, by the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers. It doesn't make any sense to me, but a lot of this doesn't. Hey, I, have, I just have one observation I'd like to share with everybody or anybody who's still here. I am here and I'm listening to a lot of expense, a lot of money after the fact. I don't know how many millions or billions of dollars this is going to eventually end up to be, but I have a complaint I'd like to lodge, and it has to do with firefighting. I know this was a crazy, a crazy hot fire, but in this one specific time, I gave the fire department two hours to come to a site, which I identified as being a site that would pretty much destroy Revenant Valley, and nobody came. So all of the citizens along the eastern slope here in Redwood Valley fought as hard as they could to stop this fire, and nobody came. So what you see coming down Road J and over down Road I and across is because nobody came. Nobody helped. All right, so I asked these men who came out here to fight, do you know what you're doing out here? No, they don't have a map. They've never been here before. They don't know about all the wells or all of the, the, the acres and acres of foot, foot, pond, water that's available. No terrain of knowledge. No knowledge of how wide anything is or what the breadth of it is or, or anything else. And because of that, we're going to spend all this money and a lot of these people are out of their homes. Now, I understand that the firefighters Spend four days on and four days off. I've talked to quite a few of them. Maybe it's even four days on and four days off. And I ask them, what do you do when you do all that? Well, they do housekeeping, or they do this, they do that. There's other things to keep them busy while they're there. And I think that's a very good thing. They should stay busy. But the question is this. In an area like Redwood Valley, or Potter Valley, where it's defined, and everybody will know pretty much where it's going to burn when it burns, why doesn't the fire department know that? Or why aren't there overlays? Why isn't there computers? In, in, in today's time of information, why do not we have an information inside of one of these trucks that went around for two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Why are why do not the men inside there know where, where they're fighting or what they're doing? Richard, no, I I, I lost my houses. I lost and, and he lost his house. His house stood for half an hour. And not no one came to put it out. No, it was stood there with everything burning around it, and it was there. Nobody came with water. Right, I have read, I have read the Cal Excuse Fire. Excuse me, sir. We shot a representative here. All right, let me finish. I'm going to leave it to a point, and then you can just knock me up here. I read the Cal Fire information about water storage. Nowhere do I see in that information about delivery system. You should have fire, you should have water at your house, but it doesn't mention delivery system. Here's what I think it should say. You should have water at your house, and you should have a delivery system, because we are not going to come in time to help you. And that's my feeling. Because my house would be there, and everybody's house along East Road and Down Road J would be there if I had one pump or one truck. So, um, the wife, Annette, my neighbors, my babies. And I want to thank my husband right now because he saved three houses that night. He never left. He remained together with the neighbor like the people at the reservation that did not give up. And he saved the remaining houses in Roche by putting out fires. And I just would like to recommend that maybe in this rural area we can establish better plans for exactly vineyard ponds that are plentiful are set up with fire hoses or whatever, or people with swimming pools like McGee's. I think if there was locally enabled plans that we focus on that as an aftermath to become smart, and if better neighborhoods that can help this volunteer fire department or Cal Fire to use existing resources because it really works for people out together. So that's just, I would like to add that. I asked for a waiver 
to go in to save my house. It was there Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay, folks, let, let me answer a couple of these questions here, okay? My name is Brendan Turner. I'm the acting fire chief at Red Valley Cal Health Fire Department. First, I want to start off by saying how very sorry I am for everybody's home who was lost. While your homes were burning, my in-laws' house was burning down as well. So were hundreds of others. So I know that there's that emotional attachment for all of us, myself included, that we really wanted to get in there and we wanted to put every one of those fires out. This was an extraordinary event. This fire, and I can let Chief Gonzalez speak to this a little bit more because he has some of the calculations, moved at an unprecedented rate through Mendocino County. I believe we were at 20,000 acres by the next day, close to it, within a couple hours. Our priority on this fire, and you may disagree with me on this, but our priority on this fire was life safety. These men and women back here, you guys raise your hands. These are volunteers that went out along with citizens of this community and were affecting rescues of their neighbors. These people don't commute from out of the area. These are your community members. So I do take some umbrage to being said that we did nothing that night. And I'm not trying to be argumentative with you, Mr. Rhodes, I'm not. What I'm saying is this fire was extraordinary. If it was just in that one part of the neighborhood, me, we would have been there. Let me say this. Sure. There wasn't a plan, no matter whether the, the winds were at five miles an hour or 50 miles an hour. You don't have a plan. No one knew what that terrain was like. The terrain has been like that for 100 years. Yeah. All right, everybody, if you're going to fight a fire, if you're going to go to war, if you're going to battle something, please you want to know, back, you want to answer. Mr. Rhodes, we did go to battle that night. Show me that. Show me something. Show me something. Call me back on the telephone sometime. Mr. Rhodes. Yeah. Mr. Rhodes, please. Again, I'm very sorry for everyone in this room that lost their home. The speed at which this fire moved. And okay. This fire increased in size so dramatically that we were running from door to door. We were dealing with burn victims. Okay. Well, we were out there. We were doing the best that we could. We had every single fire department in Mendocino County, with the exception of maybe one, that responded mutually to this fire. We had Cal Fire resources, and we had a regional crisis that, again, is unprecedented. Sir, my neighbor says three houses because they let in from the north. Nobody got in from the south. I was asking the sheriff, if I asked everybody, why can't I go back in? That, that would be a question for the sheriff who had to leave. We are not in charge of doing the evacuations. I guess, let me say this, my point is this. Awesome. It's, it's my, my opinion, after talking to the men who are out there trying to do their job, is that they didn't have the information to do their job. For instance, some of the guys didn't know that Bro J goes all the way up to the Eagles of Bob and Mr. area. And in that area, would you stop, Richard, just one minute? County staff is getting ready to leave. They're going to be closing down in the back. If you have something, please go back there right now. Thanks. Uh, speaking for the water company, I was told to expect a bunch of people asking me how to get their water on. Real simple. Call the office, make an appointment, meet us, we'll turn you on. Okay, I don't know. Richard, where do you go? Okay. Anyway, county staff is beginning to close up. You have questions, um, any sign up, paperwork, please go back there. Thank you.
those of you that have been coming to the Redwood Valley Grange, I just want to let you know we're going to be open one more week. We're serving a meal a day. The hours are 11 to 3. We're still taking some donations. The majority of the clothing donations is going down into Ukiah. We're working on a local Redwood Valley site for a donation center. And this Friday, we're having an open pantry, free food giveaway, just like we did. Sunday, we have a community dry chip barbecue. It's free, it's here. It's happening with the Lions Club, the Redwood Valley Branch, and the Redwood Valley Store. So you bring your extras, but the dry chip and chicken will be here and be barbecue. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.